This is ridiculous. Fred, you're walking on water. You are beer Jesus. I'm the beer Jesus. I just want to say, this is probably one of the best experiences of my life. For the last seven years, Brad and I have been traveling the world, hunting down the best breweries and beers, as well as searching out the most amazing places to enjoy them. Drink it in! We've met home brewers in the Arctic to help judge at their beer competitions. We witnessed the pure insanity of China's own Oktoberfest. We've got lost deep inside the mazes that make up Chechia's lager cellars. We've traveled halfway around the globe just to taste the best IPAs fresh at source and lots, lots more besides. These adventures have taught us amazing things about beer, brewing, people and the environment and how they all come together to create a culture we've fallen in love with. So join us as we explore the world through the medium of beer. Meeting master brewers, digging into beer history, brewing collaborations and try to act sober against all the odds. Through our travel documentaries, beer school episodes and sofa sessions, we'll teach you everything you need to know to enjoy beer at its best and to appreciate the wonder that is the world's favourite alcoholic drink. We're here to show you that at the end of a long day, all you need is love and beer. Welcome to the Craft Beer Channel. I don't know about you, but I love an emotionally explorative intro. It's beautiful. I never get bored of watching that intro. <laughs> the way it doesn't need updating because it says, for seven years we've been exploring God. Seven? No! Ten years, Jerry! Ten, ten years! Ten years. But we'll be uh -huh. announcing some pretty exciting things uh, to come very soon. Anyway, enough about us. Chris, welcome to the stream. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah. Well, thank you for having us. Um, it's been a slightly stressful pleasure so far, but we're here. We've got beer, here, um, and it's all downhill from here. Um, tell us a little bit about, uh, about yourself uh, at Colonel first, uh, while we enjoy some delicious table beer, and then we'll dig into the beers. Yeah, so um, I've worked at the Colonel um, uh, about two years now, um, but I've had an association with the brewery for, uh, you know, I guess the best part of the last decade. Um, and uh, that's been, you know, it, it's kind of, it's been very much part of my London experience since I moved here to London. And um, it, it sort of in many ways, uh, you know, defines a lot of the the uh, experience that I've had in London since I first came here. And, and since I first started working in beer um, over a decade ago. Um, so I worked at Partizan Brewery for a little while, and um, uh, that was a very enjoyable experience. Um, and of course, the two breweries were very closely associated to begin with. A lot of people may know that um, the kit that we started with at Partizan came from here at the Colonel to begin with, and actually has since made a journey to uh, Barcelona um, uh, with a, another friend of ours who who we've worked together with and have a brewery in uh, Barcelona called Cyclic Beer Farm. Uh, they also make wine now as well. So that kit has had a, a big journey, but that's sort of been a central kind of component of the glue that's held all of uh, all of these things together. Um, yeah, I worked at Protestant for quite a few years. Um, and after that, I did some consultancy work um, with uh, a few different companies. Um, and, and sort of uh, kind of development of uh, different beers and stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, I also took a little detour to work in kombucha for a while, which was uh, <laughs> an interesting one. Um, some of the viewers may be familiar with that beverage. It's certainly becoming more popular now in the low and no category. Um, and uh, yeah, that was very interesting, especially because I'm very interested in the kind of uh, mixed firm side of things and uh, understanding, you know, kind of fermentation from slightly different viewpoints than necessarily necessarily the straight ahead Saccharomyces brewers yeast fermentation route. Um, uh, yeah, and um, after, you know, kind of many years working elsewhere, uh, eventually getting to work here is, I mean, it, 
I consider it a, a great privilege, but a bit of a homecoming for me as well. I, you know, um, I have so many friends that uh, are now colleagues that I've known for many years. So it's a wonderful place to work. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, we'll get into the joy that is Colonel and the role that they've that they've had in the craft beer industry in the UK for longer than 10 years. That's Way really longer than 10 years. I love that, that the kit has gone from here, handed on to parts and then has, has, has gone elsewhere. Like... That is, I think that's 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 kernel to a T, isn't it? You're always kind of sharing knowledge and kits, even at this point. Yeah, it's pretty amazing because it, you know, I think everyone will admit that it's not the greatest kit in the world. <laughs> and certainly, as years go by, and as um, you know, brewing technology has advanced and etc. You know, it's the fact that it's still out there making really great beer is yeah. actually a, it's a lovely legacy. I think really. It's got a character. You're right. And I think, Brad, I think you're right that it, it, it sort of speaks to the kind of ethos of the kernel is that kind of um, understanding that, you know, kind of uh, sharing things, whether it be kind of knowledge, experience, and sometimes physical things as well. Yeah. And you said, like, obviously being like you've been on the mile a long time personally, but obviously the, the kernel's been here. You said everyone on the mile kind of shares stuff. Like you've got all these amazing bakeries around here. You never short of a bit of bread or exactly and i, I think know. that's very nice there's a very there's something very collaborative about a lot of the producers that started in this area around spa terminus around bermondsey that um they're very willing to share um you know in in everything you know in their produce and their time and it's a it's a very collaborative and open community that's a it's a great place to work and i think does wonders for um you know that kind of community spirit and uh, you know people's well-being in terms of their job satisfaction yeah i mean like obviously everyone knows the beer mile is a sort of destination place for for all kinds of groups of people these days but you you i don't know what was was the colonel the first on the mile was there a diff was there another brewery before colonel i guess i mean i remember visiting the colonel and uh just to hang out and drink beers um when they were on the end of what is now maltby street market but rope walk there um and I guess, yes, they were the first brewery in the area. Um, and, I mean, if you look at how that's changed over this period of time now, it's incredible to think of how many stops there are. Not necessarily all breweries, but great places to drink, eat food. It's developed incredibly over the last 10 years. Um, and that just shows what the appetite, I think, is amongst consumers for, you know, good quality produce and, you know, a great way to spend the day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because yeah, it's really not just beer. It's bakeries. It's, you know, cheese Absolutely, was here yeah. for a long time beforehand. Um, you said butchers and all kinds of things have, have moved in partly off of perhaps the strength of what Colonel were doing in 2009, which is bringing, bringing people to the area. Yeah. And I think, uh, I mean, Bermondsey's seen a whole uplift in general. You know, there are a lot of uh, new builds here in terms of apartments and stuff. But also, you know, you just have to look at the <laughs> property market, dare we, in the current economic climate. But, um, yeah, there, there are a lot more people, um, you know, kind of seeing it as a, a great place to live because it's very close to the city centre. And, um Traditionally, of course, it was uh, a hub of, of industry and stuff, you know, very close to the river. And um, it's nice to see people producing stuff again here in, in the way that they would have done maybe even, you know, 100 years ago. I can remember, like, I don't know, I'm trying to remember how far back it was, but they did used to be like MOT garages and, you know, like not cut and shut shops, but like certainly motor garages. And it, it, it this, this whole area is like the culture that has sprung up around beer and food is amazing like yes yeah. it's made this a, like a destination place and i think Burr market had a big deal to do yeah. with that as well you know that kind of like kind of bleeding out from there from the kind of london bridge area um and i think that's another thing that's nice about bermondsey is there's 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 that kind of abutting of um things you still have the kind of old school traditional like kind of you know kind of southeast london kind of culture and you do the, I mean, the garage is still there brad you can yeah yeah there's uh, one that's got really tasty uh porsches in it like, <laughs> when, whenever i cycle past that I'm like, oh that one on Druid street yeah that's pretty high it's end amazing um, no. your cut and shop shops are more no um, <laughs> uh, yeah i think i think it's nice that that does still coexist and there is yeah. still a, a feeling of like kind of genuine yeah there's uh, room for everyone and, like, you know you still got your chippers and your um you know kind of old school pubs so it, it's it's a cool area for that reason. Definitely, hundred percent. Well, I'm, ju- I'm just going to interrupt firstly to apologise for the sound, which is apparently all now fixed. Great. We, we were a shade, a shade hot. Even the trains were distorting. Apparently. Oh dear. Uh, the trains are, of course, they're not real. We just added that sound effect because we're in a brewery in South London. <laughs> Should I press play again? <laughs> 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 keep doing it. Um, so yeah, those are trains that are only what six foot of others. 
just rocking along. Uh, terrifying, we, terrifying, Johnny. <laughs> we are. You may have noticed this isn't the craft beer studio. Uh, this is actually Colonel Brewery. Uh, there was going to be a live brewery tour, but now there's going to be a hurriedly recorded 15 minutes ago <laughs> brewery tour, which we've just <laughs> uploaded, um, which is still great, just not live. So you can't ask any questions during that portion, but Brad can go for a week. Um, just in case you haven't been on our streams before, hopefully we've got lots of amazing people joining us from the lovely Bruiser uh, who sorted out the boxes and been working with us on this stream. Huge shout out to them. Um, but if you haven't been on one of these before, just ask your questions. We'll get to them as frequently as we possibly can. If you don't get your question answered during the stream, uh, we have a Q&A at the end of the show. The ticker's going by at the bottom, bottom here. But around about nine o'clock, we'll start taking us literally just answering questions. Uh, and we'll be joined by Lewis from Bruiser as well. He's got some questions from uh, the Bruiser community. Um, if you are dying to have your question answered by Chris, Brad, or myself, you can use the super chat function <laughs> in which you will pay as much as you, I was going to say a small amount. You could pay a large amount if you wanted Could to. You? I uh, wouldn't advise it. <laughs> <laughs> ruin my sales pitch uh, to get your question answered at the very next available opportunity which will probably be chris being allowed to take a sip of beer do you know what's even better than money johnny um likes and subscribes okay right okay yeah. if you haven't liked and if you're new to to the craft beer channel please like and subscribe and look, have a look how many films we made over 500 quality films johnny 564 quality oh. films across 10 years my god yeah what a rate that's more than one a week isn't it it is. No, wait. A, no. Big, no, we can't add up. Is that our strong point? No. No, it's definitely not more than one. <laughs> At one point, one we week. made more than one a week. I had to tell you to stop. Oh, yeah, we did. Yeah, too much. I was, I was, that's why I've got no hair. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, we also have a drinking order coming uh, up on screen right now, and this is the order we're going to be drinking the beers. If you want to ask a question about any of the beers in the box, please do. We will try and get to it at the next point that we can or at the end but we're going to be starting with the enigma pills um yeah you guys have been i've, I've drunk a lot because i was stressed about the sound so uh um, we even explain what chris does here i, I uh did we no i'm not I, sure if i, I guess we can assume brewer from the intro yeah so i'm i'm one of the uh production staff here i mean i think um maybe some people will find that the setup in the current brewery is not necessarily quite as uh strictly hierarchical hierarchical as you might find in other breweries but yeah we have a production team and we all we all switch around doing um the various jobs that that involves in production right. so, so it's not between... like brew house seller packaging it's no so it, it's every, yeah, on any given day and i think that's what's very nice for um uh, for an employee you know is to we're all very collaborative we're working with mm. one another all the time and on any one day we may be responsible for fermentation management or cellaring um or work production or packaging um or you know maintenance of any of the beers that you know inside the barrel program and stuff like that so it's a yeah it's a a diverse job but yeah i'm, I'm a part of that team and very much enjoy it that, that approach is brilliant as well isn't it because like there aren't many breweries where you get to kind of work in every sort of facet um it's it's a very unique approach yeah i think so and i think it, it's uh it's very much the approach that this company has to to, to everything yeah. that we do, and it gives everyone a leg up as well, doesn't it? Really, like you can kind of. I'm guessing you you might take people on that are you know not massively skilled in one particular area, but they can kind of learn on the job. Absolutely, we've we've had uh, you know, and I think, and that's what we all learn from one another. You know, so people who have very strong proficiencies in one background or, or a kind of real understanding of something, we're able to share those skills and, and knowledge. And I think that's why things work very well and very seamlessly here because we. We do have that approach. Lovely. Right, let's dig into the beer. We've still got some small sound issues, but I'm, I'm fine-tuning it by the time we're drunk. Uh, by the time we've had a drink, <laughs> it might be fixed. You, we, yeah, if, if it's really terrible, guys, we can just pull out and just use the laptop audio, potentially. Nobody wants a laptop Nobody audio. Wants laptop audio. Let, well, let's, got all this equipment. let's dig into this beer. So I, I understand you had a hand in all four of these beers. Uh, of the beers we've chosen for the tasting, yeah. interestingly, yes, it just it happens to have worked out that way. So um, I probably at least at least in the I can remember that at least all of them I think I did the work production for, which is not necessarily the most important mm -hmm. part of producing beer. In fact, often is actually really only the the start point. Um, there's a lot more that happens after that. Can I trouble you for that glass, Johnny? Oh, of course you can. Sorry, I'd, I'm just pouring myself a beer without without any care in the world. It's a bit of low brow, a bit of low brow, guys. Um, so you, it took Colonel over a decade to make its first lager. Is that right? Yeah, I think. Um, and 
again, as with everything here, I think the idea was very much that um, wanted to come to a place where we felt we could produce something in the way that we wanted it to be, rather than producing it for the sake of the fact that it was the zeitgeist or um, that there would be a lot of interest in it. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, and there are a lot of us here at the brewery who are very, very into drinking lager. I think it's, uh, as a as a beer style or as a category of beer, it's something that we all enjoy a lot. So we're quite perfectionist over it. Um, so it was quite important to us that um, that we made it in a way that we really wanted to drink it. Mm -hmm. I guess. And and um, what 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 is that? What before we say what we're getting from this beer? What was it that a, a Colonel <laughs> Lager, Colonel Pills, had to be? Well, I think. Um, the big thing about Pilsner as a beer style is like the drinkability of it. It's, it's got to be, it, there's a reason why, you know, um, whatever kind of version of pills that you're drinking and that it's the biggest selling beer in the world um, as a category, because it has that, it has that repeat drinkability. It has the refreshing quality. Um, it's fairly clean, but it has just enough uh, to keep you interested in it. And of course we wanted to do it our way as well, you know, so all of these pills are um, uh, dry hopped a little with, uh, mostly new world hops um and i think that that gives it a little bit of an extra stamp but in terms of the beer itself you know we wanted to make sure that we could um the really important thing with lager beers is the amount of time they spend in tank really that they uh, or the the amount of time that you take to condition them etc you know lager takes time it's a cold fermented beer it's a slow fermented beer and it's a, a cold conditioned beer so the more time that you can give lager the better um, so if you're struggling for tank time and you have a certain amount of space and you need to push them out, inevitably you're going to find that, you know, you're not producing the best quality um, product. And I think some of the great lager producers in the world, which you guys have made visits to, I think a lot of them will tell you that the lager is a lot about time. So we wanted to have the tank space and we wanted to have the time to be able to produce it. Really, When, when we were at Budvar, they said the furthest they pushed it was 400 and... <laughs> yeah. about 460 days was the longest they'd lagered. Wow. And they were amazed at sort of it, it. It goes through the process they understood, and then it started going through this process of like peaks and troughs. A bit like when you age a beer and bottle, yeah. where it tastes different. Sort of uh, was it week by week, I think he was saying. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's just an excuse for the brewers to go down and check on it. But um, yeah, like you say, it, it, it's a it's a slow matured. Like the laws of thermodynamics, you're fermenting lower, so you're fermenting slower, and it's it does create a really different profile. You know, I've this doesn't taste necessarily like a kernel beer. You know, you feel like you could pick out the ales from kernel, but this is something yeah. entirely aside. Um, and part of that, what's interesting is you've picked mostly new world hops. Can you talk us through why, why you guys had gone for that? Yeah, I guess that, um, you know, a lot of us at the brewery are very big fans of, um, you know, really classic traditional German lager or Czech lager. Um, and those are, um, you know, I think, I think those are so inimitable that to try and simply recreate that style would be uh, foolhardy in a way because you always are measuring up to that same place. Right, Whereas yeah. if, you know, we wanted to produce something that has all of the elements of that, but also, you know, another part of the ethos here at the Colonel is that, you know, we're all on the production team. We all have a certain amount of autonomy in terms of the way that we make a beer and everyone will have a slightly different nuance into the way that they brew. And we have a very, you know, kind of hands-on kit in the way that we produce things. So um, in the same way that you get that idiosyncrasy with the, um, you know, the eels that we produce on the other side, th there will be a little bit that with, with the lager as well. And lager, as everyone, well, as most people will know, is um, there's much more precision about it, I guess. It's, um, it's a beer that uh, shows up a lot of flaws if it's, um, if it's incorrectly produced. And it, it, you can't hide behind a lot. But... Um, we so there's not as much tweak room on that side of things you got to get things right but you know the kind of expression of choosing a dry hop that um from exciting new world hops that have slightly different um sometimes much bolder profiles than the european hops we were producing something that um i think has a stamp that kind of gives it some kind of uniqueness and i think that's that, that's really what what the idea behind it is mm -hmm. um and, and and are you having to because, you know, throwing something like Enigma, which I'm right, it has very high alphas, right? Yeah. yeah. So you, you, do you have to really ramp down the amount of, you know, the dry hop that you're putting in or the, the hot side that you're putting in to keep the beer in balance? 
Yeah, I think we have to think about what hops we're using. But then, I mean, very early on in this uh, pills journey that we had, we were already using hops like Galaxy, you know, kind of very early on. And that yeah. and was very, very full on. We have tweaked the pills recipe over the past, you know, kind of uh, year and a half or so, I would say. Um, we have dialed down the bitterness a little bit on it from when we first produced it. Um, we do prefer the pills to have that kind of maybe more kind of northern German style, a little bit of a bitter snap to it. Um, so there's more bitterness than you might find in uh, more commercially produced lagers or lagers that you'll find more often. But I think it, for me, it gives it that little bit more balance and drinkability. Um, and yeah, for example, the uh, the beer that we currently have in tank, the pills that we have in tank, uh, is produced with a much softer, more delicate dry hop and um the difference in the profile is very very palpable um and i think that's nice as well for a consumer because you know you're going to have you'll have the pilsner again but you'll see that there's a different iteration of it and i think that's what we like about all of our beers um and i think it's what most of our dedicated consumers have started to find as well that um you know the nuances it's not a lack of consistency it's a it's just literally about you know a kind of a slight change that gives you a different aspect on the beer. Um, and so that's what we try to do each time we produce. Mm -hmm. and we, we've, we've talked lots about the hops in the lager, but can, can you tell us about the, the, the malts and the, the yeast and I guess the water as well? Uh, yeah, so um, yes, the, the, the water profile is, is different for, for this than it is um, in terms of our like salt additions and stuff that then we would do for our, um, for our pale ales and uh, we would use, um, for example, we use uh, lactic acid here instead of using, um, uh, you know, kind of mix of different acid for um, kind of changing the water profile. But again, everyone's looking for when you're producing lager, you're looking for that that kind of water profile that you know was so classic in uh, kind of Czech pilsner. You know that you, that you have that um, you know some more uh, softer water profile, uh, higher chloride content. Um, so yeah, we treat the water very differently for that. Um, malt wise, um, we actually all the malt we use in this is uh, Simpson's low color pale malt. So right. um, uh, it's, I mean, you can see it's it's a super clear beer, as yeah. clear as you can get for like a non filtered beer, and um, pretty much, um, especially because it's cold conditions for so long. Um, uh, and we're very happy with that malt. We think it uh, it has a it has a lovely rounded sweetness to it, um, which I think is, uh, you know. I, you guys have talked on this channel, I think, a lot probably about um, uh, the kind of about malt really being on show in lager because it's not the same as the fermentation profile you get from pale ales where you have so many other things going mm. on. Um, and actually, you get a lot of that kind of sweet honeyed character from from the malted barley. Um, so, yeah, I think if we had a, a, if we wanted to change the malt, I think at this stage that's something we would have done at this point, but that's not something that's been a barrier for us, um, even though we're not use, using traditional lager malt, shall we say. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, it's got, I mean, the beer spends usually, I think, a minimum of six weeks in tank and probably a little more. Um, so that's the period of time it really takes to make a beer. And to just give you a frame of reference or the viewers a frame of reference, you know, um, ale fermentations, uh, pale ales and stuff are, are, are turned around in more like, kind of two weeks time um we obviously have uh most of our beers are um secondary fermentation um so they're they're reconditioned in the package in the bottle or in the keg um so that gives it a little it needs a little extra time then for that to obviously create the carbonation with the lager beer it's forced carbonated so um essentially it's a good day when we produce it here in the brewery because as as soon as it's being packaged and coming off the line those bottles are ready to drink um oh yeah i never really thought about that that sad that's, that's, side impact of the of the bottle conditioned beer. Yeah. yeah, that's the only time when we get to pull freshies off the line and yeah. make them as when we're producing yeah. lager. So, is that why you're now making lagers? <laughs> <laughs> that, that was my question. How, when did you start making lagers? Why did you start making? I mean, they're amazing and they're very different. Yeah, I think that. Um, uh, so Ben, who's uh, our senior brewer here, has uh, always been very into uh, lager, and I think uh, again, there are a lot of us. I, I know it has a. Um, uh, important place for Evan as well and I think a, a lot of us are very uh, really enjoy drinking lager and so as we spoke before there was a reticence about producing it because we wanted to make sure we could do it justice but also there was a desire to produce it because 
we wanted to drink it and you know we felt that we wanted to get to a place where we felt like we could do that um so it was you know a little bit about infrastructure um we talked when we were downstairs but we, we've got some new tanks that mm. um that do the uh that can hold the pressure that we need to be able to put the the, the top pressure on the beer or, or or essentially carbonate it um ready for um uh, for packaging so it was that and also those extra tanks also equal extra tank space um so you know we needed to have the time spent in tank and for for viewers that's about you know in terms of the capacity of a brewery a lot about um how much you produce is not based on you know yes everyone's brewing regularly you know kind of uh, on a daily basis but it's more about how long will the how long will the beer spend in tank before you can get it out and so a lot of the cost of your product is how long it takes to produce um, and how long before you can produce another. So lagers are a longer time to do that. And if you put that in a tank that you're tying up that would have been producing something else, that if we go by the model, which I kind of roughly threw out there earlier, six weeks for us producing a lager, but two weeks for producing another beer, three beers could have been mm. produced in the period of time that we produced one other beer. So there, there are a few aspects like that, that that come around scheduling and commercials and stuff. I've just seen, I think people in the comments are playing a drinking game where you drink every time a train goes by. Can't, oh dear. <laughs> cannot advise that less. Oh dear. Um, we are a major. <laughs> yeah, it's a London just, Bridge. Very yeah, major, guys. Road, so you're going to be in trouble if you won't do be that. stopped until about uh, 12 <laughs> midnight. So. Anyway, we're playing now. Um, I mean, this, hey! <laughs> uh, this is absolutely delicious. I, it, it's very interesting to me to have like that real honey bready character mm. and that real sweet sweetness that lingers with with a lot of sort of the the uh the, the more si kind of honeyed lagers but with these big bold new world kind of hop character which you you don't really see because obviously initially we were all about dialing up the hop character and dialing down the malt character um and then we got into new england which was dialing up the yeast character and the hop character and if anything reducing the malt character yeah. even further as we yeah. just put you know, wheat and oats, which don't have huge flavour, but big texture, yeah, kind of contribution. So it, it's 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 really interesting on the palate, but without taking away the drinkability. Somebody put a comment up saying, you know, the new world hops that hot bitterness adds to the drinkability for them. I think so too. I mean, I um, uh, I would make no secret of the fact that I um, actually I. Do, I it really depends. I'm not a huge fan of the New England style, as it were, um, uh, the kind of like sweeter, um, sort of richer beers. Um, I actually really enjoy them more when they are in, um, when they're higher ABV. I, I think I prefer the double IPA, that kind of, because it, the richness sort of works with the higher alcohol. The sort of lower ABV beers, um, I, I, I desire just personally in beer a little more bitterness, a little more snap, um, and probably... Maybe even of people here at the brewery, I think I I prefer like kind of a, a bitterer beer um, in general than maybe I would suggest having spoken to enough people in the industry than than the average amount of people. So I like bitterness in a beer, and um, I think in, in in lager also. Again, you know, I, I love um, you know Yever is one mm -hmm. of my favorite beers. You know, there's that I really like that that particularly that kind of herbal like kind of snap bitterness that you get um, in those beers. I think it, it really it keeps you coming back for more. But then I'm a guy who loves really spicy food as well, so it's maybe the same kind of thing. Well, is that yeah, they, little hit that you get. They are kind of related, aren't they? they? Are. That you get that yeah. adrenaline excited hit when your palate basically goes, "You shouldn't be consuming this, really, should you? It's too bitter or it's too spicy." Um, did we talk about the yeast? No. No, because I, I, I get some real yeast character from this. Like, like there's definitely the snap, but there's also some fruitiness, I think, coming off it that I wouldn't put down to the Enigma, potentially. Yeah, so I think that um, the, the, uh, this lager yeast is very... Um, it, it is quite expressive in that it does have that kind of... Um, I would say, yeah, that look, soft fruit kind of thing that mm. um, is giving you um, a little bit of the kind of basis around that um the the enigma i think when we've done when we've done this with other hops um that are enigma is very bold but also i think it has a there's something about it it has that kind of like slightly herbal slightly green slightly grassy um it slightly venus and it was a tetanine cross yeah, else, with, yeah. With, with something north american i think right. um and i think that uh gives it a little 
even though it's a very bold hop, as we've discussed, it's high alpha and it's kind of it's big. It's not in the same category as your your kind of uh, you know galaxy kind of thing, where it was just very in your face. And I think that this has more delicacy to it um, in in the kind of nature of the uh, the top notes that are in there. And I think that plays in well with the yeast, which kind of lifts it out. So I do definitely get some berry fruit and stuff in there as well. What do you think, Brad? Is? I think it's delicious. I think it's unusual. And I think, uh, you know, this is this is kind of what I expect from Colonel, is like not the run-of-the-mill thing. You always kind of have a slight take on everything you do. Um, yeah, I think uh, whether people, whether it's their, um, I think there are some, whether it's, whether it's their thing or not, I think w what people expect from us is that we are going to, um, we produce something that's a little bit different. And um, no one expects everyone to like every beer in the world. Um, and we all have our favorites and we have things that, you know, we've all drunk enough beer that we can, you know, kind of, uh, Pick favorites. Pick, pick, yeah. pick favorites. But um, I think that we always try to do something a little bit different, but without diverging too far from what what we know is, you know, our thing. Mm -hmm. uh, well, we'll talk about the thing. We're, we're about to get onto the IPA because I know people are moving on. I just wanted to. So every every live show that I do, I, I dig into the, the the WhatsApp emoji library and try right. to when I when I flash this up on screen, I try to give the emojis that might be from this the flavors from this beer okay i couldn't okay. find white wine but i went i i, I had to go with red because enigma can occasionally have that antipodean kind of white yeah, wine I, 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 and, I would accept that and, sure. and then i can't i can't remember now it wasn't strawberry i wanted but they didn't have the berry i was going for and i got the honey right but otherwise you know it's tricky with the kernel beer because i hadn't had that beer before i have had a, a mosaic ipa which we're about to have before but it won't be this one and then I have had the Damson, but again, that's going to be different. So it's probably only the export stout that might be a beer I've truly experienced before. Yeah, no, I, I, you don't have enough emojis for that one, though, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I do. We'll, we'll, we'll see what emojis I picked when we get there. But um, I think it's a swing and a miss for the Enigma Pills with red, white, and strawberries. <laughs> and so, yeah, what's that let me down there? Um, that's a spritzer, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, somewhere between that and, like, sangria. Yeah. Um, Right, yeah, but right, right ahead of me. Let's swift, do it. Swiftly okay. moving on with proceedings. Quick table beer. Refresh the colour. There you go, you lovely people. There we go. Thank you very much. So fresh glassware, Johnny. Fresh glassware. This rarely happens on the craft oh, beer channel. We always get told off for this. We, stuff. we do constantly. Um, oh my god, eleven comments have come in since I last checked. Um, <laughs> while I dig into those, um, you were telling us beforehand you don't really like mosaic. Yes, I'm not the biggest fan of this hop, and as you pointed out, I, I, I was responsible for the work production of this beer. I think it's a combination of um, when this hop was very new, I had, you know, everyone was coming out with a beer made with mosaic, and I had quite a few, and quite a few that I really didn't enjoy, um, and I think uh, maybe that colored my feeling about it. Um, I've always found that I find it better in conjunction with other things, and um, when it's paired with other hops... Um, and I think by necessity, there's a kind of coalescence of those uh, kind of flavors together. And I think any brewer will tell you this. It's like you have to play around with things until you find, you know, a sweet spot where a couple of things work together very well. And there are a few that are tried and tested that you'll see continually. Citra Galaxy is a classic one, mm -hmm. you know, um, because people have found that those work very well together. Um, so, yeah, long story short, um, there are some iterations of Mosaic that, um, I, that I'm not very fond of. Um, but actually, after having produced this, the first time I tried it was in, in the taproom next door, and uh, one of the staff had sort of said to me, oh, this is a beer that you made, and was very surprised because it's no secret <laughs> amongst everyone that I've sort of vehemently said that I don't like Mosaic. And she said, I can't believe you produced this beer. Um, it's really good. You've got to try it. Um, at which point I did, and I was very pleasantly surprised. So I, I really I have enjoyed this IPA a lot. And it is this is single hot Mosaic the whole way through, so it's hot side and it's, uh, it's bittered with mosaic it's bittered with mosaic also yeah so what, what kind of character it's very high alpha it? so it's pretty easy bittering yeah we, we still use hop flowers in our kettle so um we, we occasionally will use some uh resin extract for um you know uh pure ibu we, uh, yeah exactly if we're if we're doing um so we can use the our our setup to do um so for example all the pilsners and um 
Uh, some of the beers we produce will be Whirlpool beers um, when we can use pellet hops in, in the kettle. Um, and then we essentially we use that vessel as a, as a double for anyone who's interested in the technical side, but we can use the uh, kettle as a kettle Whirlpool. Um, we don't do that frequently on the beers um, because we still use whole flowers in a lot of other aspects. So often um, we try to pair up um, if we're doing single hop beers, we'll we will use the hop flowers um, and the pellets to match um, for single hop beers so we can get, an, especially when we do uh, new season hops. So for example, we had a showcase uh, a few weeks back where we had just gotten some of the new season Yakima um, North American hops uh, and we will choose to do a full expression of that one hop so that we can look at them in four pale ales side by side and see exactly what the character is. Because for us, that's kind of our baseline, you know, the pale ale, um, we're having the same grist, uh, the same fermentation, the same yeast, and we look at what the hop character is, um, which is a little divergence um, <laughs> from there to say. But yeah, so this is uh, this is all mosaic the whole way through, hop flowers in the kettle, and and then uh, dry hopped also. Um, it's it's a great aroma because it's it, it's got a, like a layered aroma. Like when you swirl it and give it a sniff, it it's it's really kind of piney and resiny, and then. It gets stickier and danker the more, yeah. <laughs> the more you sniff at it. It gets quite jammy the more you get yeah, in there. Yeah. And then. Are you uh, are you going out on hop selections uh, over to Yakima and stuff? Or Evan sometimes has been, I think, yeah. in the past, um, uh, and certainly gets invited. Um, I'd love to do that. Uh, yeah. Wouldn't You're it be right. Wouldn't it be nice? Yeah. <laughs> um, yes. I, I mean, I think the hops we get from Yakima Chief are are incredibly good quality, I have to say. Um, of, you know, we use a few different suppliers and um, the Yakima Chief Hawks are, without fail, um, exceptionally good in terms of the quality of their processing. And it's really nice to just open the bag for the first time, get the chance, particularly when we got new season hops this year, where we were able to open those up. It's really, it's actually, it's a very exciting uh, time as a brewer to get those new hops in hops that you're familiar with yeah. you know um and you have seen season by season year on year and to just get like a little bit of that just get your hands in them and really get a sniff of the quality um and then to see what the beer turns out like um is it it must be like super inspiring when those new hops come in just does it fire off all kinds of ideas in your head because obviously you guys kind of change the ingredients that are in the beers all the time right yeah it's great i mean you'll find that like when that happens when we're opening up these bags when, when we did when we did that a, a couple of months back or um you know when the hops come in as i say because all of us in production are you know it's a collaborative thing we're all right whoever happens to be pr the brewer producing the beer on the day was opening the hops you'll see people coming in can i get my hands in those can i get a little smell because everyone wants to know what that is get a feel for it and to try that beer and then pair them up and think about, okay, I'll use this with, you know, we all have our own ideas and we have our favorites, like people who we've been working, you know, for a good few years with these products, we, we know what we want to do with them, but like everything with seasonality, it's year on year. So you look at that crop and that product as it comes in and assess it at that point in time. And that that's when you kind of, and it can give you an inspirational thing where you sort of go, that would be great with this. And it might be something that we already have in the hop store that we've had from another season or something from that same year, but it definitely is an exciting time, you know? Uh, so is it, this is 2022 hop, 2022 mosaic? That is 2022 mosaic, yes, yeah. I've always wanted to ask about this. Do you dream in smell a vision? It's funny, I think smell, a smell is a like a really important sense of recall and like mm. for everyone i think yeah. very and to tie it to to beer i think there's there are loads of um beer experiences that i've had you know that you will come back to because of a simple smell and there can be things like you know i can there's a, i have a very vivid smell that i can conjure up of um my grandfather's pipe smoke and his pint of guinness and his uh, you know, smoked peanuts that were sat down on the table. We sat in front of them, and I was always fascinated by looking at a pint of Guinness as a kid. That, you know, when I when I smell a combination of those kind of things, sometimes I can back. just I can see that moment. Um, you need to collab with Omnipoya. I reckon they'll do it. A... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're right. Adam. Yeah, pi pipe smoke and peanut stout. Could... God damn, that sounds great. <laughs> Dry roasted pipe smoke stout. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. sells itself. To Imagine the label <laughs> that Carl will come up with yeah. for that. It'd be perfect. Yeah. <laughs>
Uh, yeah, I think, um, you know, I think aroma is a lovely thing and um, it's very much what drives, you know, so much of your taste mm. and everything. So, um, yeah, I, I love smelling things. <laughs> it's brilliant. I think it's brilliant. Like, it's, I'm not going to say it's an underrated thing, but certainly as a brewer, like, it must just be, it is, it's it's like your uh, your paint palette, isn't it? You know, like all the different flavors and stuff is how you, like, build these things out. Yeah, and you know what? Someone who actually writes recipes, you know, like making the recipes and stuff. Yeah, and you know what? The more that you, um, you know, beers that I used to drink years ago, uh, anywhere from like a teenager through to like kind of, you know, uh, through the through your period of kind of beer development, it's interesting to go back and smell those beers, shall yeah. we say? Because it's something that you don't do at the time, you know, when you're kind of, you know, the first time that you have a pint of, you know whatever kind of uh bitter on cask that you have it might not be um it might not be the the most inspiring experience at the time but when you come back and look at it later and like from a different perspective and you go well what notes am i getting off that i think like cask beer was a massive game changer for me as you know growing up in ireland uh, in a kind of quite small place you know as a younger person drinking the options for drinking beer were quite limited and i think um when I came to university in England, um, although I was, I, I was always fascinated by by stout in a way that I think a lot of my, um, we'll get onto that later because we're going to do a stout, but um, a lot of my peers weren't. It wasn't very cool in the mid nineties to drink Guinness and uh, everyone was drinking lager. But when I uh, came to uh, university in in England and and started drinking cask ale, that changed my experience of beer entirely because I I was just voracious for I want something different. There's, there's something different in every pub you went into. I was going, I'll just have that. You know, it's the, the, the excitement of going, there's something different that can come from these very simple ingredients. Um, so, yeah, I, the, the, the fascination with uh, kind of the simplicity of beer, but also the complexity of it at the same time. Just, uh, <clears throat> just made a little joke in the uh, been working on my emojis while you've been... <laughs> <laughs> You got it set up. Oh, you got it set up. Yeah, yeah. I, oh, I, nice. I, okay. I do need to make a slight tweak because again, I've got Mosaic IPA so wrong. The, the, people have been saying that's ice cream. It's not ice cream. It's sorbet. That, that's what I went for. I was trying to get peach and mangoey things, but actually, it's, it's danker than that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Dank, dank sorbet. Dank, because it's yeah. a little bit of the the, the the peach fuzz, the peach skin in there. Yeah. That 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 has a slight almost tannic quality to it it's like that kind of a little bit of tang in there i think that it... if you can't tell that to whatsapp emojis i want you can't <laughs> peach with extra tannin yeah so I, I went with sorbet and, and i've made a fool of myself um i don't know i'm quite happy with that i think yeah. i'm happier with that one johnny than the last than one, the last one. <laughs> okay fair okay it's, it's all up from here it's all up from here um everyone seems to be absolutely loving this beer uh we're getting blueberries. Somebody's saying it's the best one yet. Yes, uh, blueberries is not it's not a bad shout, actually. It, um, it's something like when Mosaic sort of came out. Well, I mean, it came out quite long, like 2010 or something. It was it was first sort of released commercially. But that was what it was kind of... Ta- it was like juicy berry character. Yeah. And I guess somewhere along the line, it's got slightly sweatier, slightly... And maybe it's the yeast a lot of people use it with as well. It became peachy and apricotty and mangoey and... This one, I think, has more berry character, maybe because it's, I guess, it's quite a clean yeast that you guys still use rather than a yeah, it's a, it's, one. It's, it's a California ale yeah. yeast that's very, very clean. Um, and certainly with our process, the way we produce it, the yeast is a is a is a baseline for us. Really, I think it's, um, you know, we know what it does every time in our fermentations, and I think that's why we can play with other things. You know, we're very happy that we the consistency of our fermentations on uh, on the um, you know the core pale beers are that's a given for mm-hmm. us so and, and that's that's nice to know because it means that essentially that's that you know you can paint the rest of the palette in yeah over the top of that. And, and tell me about so we, we we've addressed it already but so you still bottle condition and keg condition yeah everything that's ale yeast yes uh we have started doing some cask beer um which some of the viewers may be um may be aware of um obviously available in the tap room here but also um we don't produce a great amount of it, but um, uh, that goes out to some of our customers as well. So you will be able to see the Colonel Beer and Cask now occasionally. Um, any any particular sort of pubs you shout out for, for like great 
kind of on cask. The Sutton Arms is yeah. absolutely amazing in uh, in Farringdon. Um, uh, they, I mean, they do great cask beer. They keep their cask really well. Um, we had a little showcase there a while back. Um, Southampton Arms, great place as well. Um, can't say enough good things about those. My old um, local. Best pub, yeah. best pub in the world. Favourite pub in the world, right? pub in the world. Can't beat it. Yeah. But yes, so everything is secondary uh, fermentation in package um, still. And I think a big part of the character of these beers actually comes from that. A lot of those top notes. Is that That's where I was going. That's where I was going. Yeah, there's a lot of character from that. And I think exactly what we don't want in the Pilsner Um uh, you know, uh, and exactly why we wouldn't do that. But that beer—that's a—that's a clean beer, and why we wanted to, you know, that's a forced carbonated beer. It's, um, you know, we make sure that it ha- has spent all the time and tank that it needs to before it comes out, and it's—it's it's, the beer is ready to drink when it comes. For example, we have one in tank right now. We could we can open the tap, we can drink it out of the tank. It tastes just the way we want it to taste in bottle. Um, whereas these beers, that they do evolve and develop over the, you know, kind of seven to ten days that they spend warm conditioned before they go out and it is a very traditional english way of producing beer um uh and it's i think even though these are i guess we would describe this as modern style beer a lot of i I guess there's a there's a there's a dichotomy between some of the things that we produce i think we're more modern thinking beer but um you know with uh a traditional bent i think Mm. um so a large part of the character of our beers, um, the pale beers particularly, where you can really see that kind of character comes from the secondary fermentation, and, and we wouldn't change it for that reason. Because um, if you went to, you know, if you, if you go to any any brewery on the west coast and said, you know, the first thing we do with our beers once they're packaged is stick them in a warm room for ten days, they'd lose their mind, right? Right, exactly. <laughs> Which is interesting because they're still huge hop character to these beers like it doesn't feel like that seems to do the beer any harm really and you're gaining character so a a lot of that kind of fruitiness and stuff that 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 comes uh i think really only comes when i mean we all taste the beers from tank you know as they're they're finished fermentation um and we taste them after they've been dry hopped you know you can you can see that there's a progression by the time that they get into the bottle or into the keg um and it it definitely comes from the, as you say, it almost seems antithesis in a way, especially with, uh, you know, hot products that, you know, there's, um, and I can understand it very particularly with like New England styles and stuff where things are just like so full of hops that um, any kind of, uh, you know, any kind of maltreatment of that kind of product at that stage, whether it be like kind of temperature or oxidation or any of that kind of thing is going to degrade the product really, really quickly. Um, and, you know our 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 packaging and uh, uh, and our bottling line is um, uh, you know we're very confident in the fact that you know the beer has not been oxidized before it goes into package. Um, the warm conditioning, I guess it uh, it gives it a chance to create something else in there, um, and it it's there are, are scientists who can tell you I'm sure exactly what's going on in there. But you know, as brewers, I guess we have this kind of um a holistic approach to things where we understand uh most of us uh, there are some people at the very top end who have the you know the, the great knowledge but we have a holistic approach to things where we understand you know enough of the science to 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 get the job done and the, and the rest of it is a kind of creative approach and sometimes it's things uh you know you, it, it's a trial and error thing and once you find that something's working it's you know there's a harmony with that where you, you you don't want to change it i think yeah i mean you see it a lot i think in belgian brewing where you know the science has moved along yeah a long way but it's always worked for them so changing it is a bigger risk than following the science almost yeah and i think for, for, I, that was a big uh that was a big pull for me in in terms of brewing because i come from a, a very creative background and, and not a science background at all although um and my obsession with beer was always on the like a um a kind of creative idea of, of what it was and the um and also like its cultural and social history and importance and all of those things were very important to me and uh, i still have i'm very nerdy about those things about the kind of history of like kind of beer and beer recipes and um but also i think that it allows you to you know, you need to understand enough about how to produce beer in order to be able to try and play with things a little bit. Right. Um, and that um, 
yeah, there, there, there's an artistry to it that um, is is very enjoyable, and um, I I think that that I think that speaks to a lot of what people enjoy about craft beer, I guess, because that has that revolution has been about people taking what people have known for you know millennia and and doing something new with it. We can always recreate and. and mm -hmm. Uh, we've got a question, a very specific question, which I've been hovering over. There it is. Okay. Uh, with Smithick's Irish Red being big in Ireland, do you love red ales? How come most people are very wrong about hating them? Very Tell me about red ales. Colonel's never I'd... made a red ale? Well, we make the London Brick, which is a red rye ale. Right. Um, and uh, I guess it's a, a rye IPA, probably, is what you would say. Um, it does have a nice tawny red colour. Um, we also make a half brick, which is less hopped and probably more like what you would consider no to be a like idea. classic. Um, yeah, brick. unfortunately, you have none left. <laughs> Sorry, right. um, but yes, we. Uh, I actually do really like red ales, and growing up in Ireland, I remember drinking uh, Smithix uh, quite a lot. Um, and I think uh, I think a, a red ale is an is a nice style. What I always thought about the beer at the Smithix at the time when I drank it and I have not drunk it for many years I have to say um, is that it again, this is going to sound like me rhyming on the same old thing, it lacked a little bit of bitterness for me and I think that probably would have helped it. Um, I did like um, quite a lot of those aggressive American West Coast style beers like Arrogant Bastard and stuff, you know, kind of early on again they were just a little bit much to be um, you know, something that uh, you could really take on board as a I'm trying to think of anything that is like a can you guys think of a consistently good when when Saren first launched they made the liquid mistress, liquid mistress. on cask and I bloody loved that beer um I, it was a really good beer um they brought it back for their 10 year I anniversary that. briefly I on cask that. I think oh, well I remember on cask that's what I remember yeah. I, I, it was a delicious beer um, shout out to Saren. Yeah, that was that was a great beer. I can't think of another red ale. Didn't I don't want to say their name. Didn't Brewdog do a red ale? Oh, they came out a long Saint. time ago. Was that I think. But no, that was a 5 a.m. Saint. Yeah, yeah, but I remember that on cask as well. That was um, good on cask. Well, yeah. that is that is old way school. back in the day. That was yeah. I, that was good. I was 2010, 2011. Yeah, was it okay? So yeah. Just post kernel. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, a long time ago. Yes. Uh, I just want to say half brick sounds like a Guy Ritchie character. <laughs> slash, <laughs> slash, the sort of James Bond villain. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Half brick. That's what we, we sell the rights to that name. Maybe. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, right. yeah could do. Um, right. Well, I think it's time for the brewery tour, which was definitely well oh. planned, well executed. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> not, not the reason why we were late broadcast. I think we we weren't quite still filming, but we were uploading. Oh, dude, we were uploading the, the video that we shot because we, we, were, we were all sorted. We were we're all also, set. could I just point out, we're in like we a... weren't still eating pizza at the time. No, 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 that did not happen. We're in a bloody row, like a really substantial railway arch that is, is almost like being in a cave underground. So, Wi Fi is yes. an issue. Yeah, it was going to be live, and then, and then yeah. that, that happened. I just saw a comment from somebody saying, are they next to a railway? We are not next to a oh, railway. We are <laughs> underneath, underneath like, the yeah. railway, as are most breweries. Uh, <laughs> you can almost <laughs> see the... Uh, yeah, you can see the arch and you can almost see the, the room vibrating. Um, so what follows now is a tour of the brewery, about seven minutes long, in which we'll see the amazing place that these beers are made, uh, and during which we will... Um, Have a wee-wee break. Yeah, yeah that so, oh, oh. Uh, like and subscribe if you haven't done already and maybe jo think about joining our patreon it's great isn't it, oh wait you? i've got a banner for that oh, come oh on. no wait no no not that banner not that uh, one not that banner uh is it this banner where discreet banners <laughs> <Johnny. You've> got, <laughs> got some secret banners there's this banner that's a good put, banner put the code cbc8 into bruiser they get eight pounds off Ooh. they get eight pounds off their first that's, box that's quite a lot and we get a little kickback we get a little so kickback, you, you yes. could definitely do that but no the uh, the one i'm trying to find is you can support our channel by doing super chat. No, the Discord. <laughs> I found it. I how, found many, it. how many beers are we in, Johnny? <laughs> two guys. Uh, <laughs> two to go. Two to go. Well, two if we're lucky. Um, yes, yeah, so you can join our Patreon. We are powered by Patreon. Everything that we do is funded by the amazing people that support our channel. There's lots of them in the comments tonight. Shout out to all of you. We look forward to seeing you in the Discord afterwards where we can just deconstruct the sound um <laughs> the trains all that kind of stuff um but yeah from two pound a month you can join that wonderful discord forum you can get 
Um, you can you can get exclusive merchandise once or twice a year, depending on how much you put in. And yep. also, you will get you will get access to the early session. <clears throat> of the beer festival we're hosting in September, bro. What? Hang on, but what? I, I, I won't say too have much. You, about what have that. you just said, Johnny? I, 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 I didn't say anything. I didn't Absolute say anything. Bomb. Hang on, we're collaborating with all sorts of people. Oh, yeah. With all sorts. I mean, <gasps> somebody from Sweden, somebody oh, from my Cornwall. God. Uh, I think this guy said uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, upcoming is the brew tour with me and Chris, and we'll see you in a few minutes. So here we go on our tour of the Colonel Brewery. Chris, lead the way. Uh, yes, we're just upstairs on the mezzanine here. This is all the office space. Um, we we'll to do all of the, uh, uh, um, you know, administrative stuff. <laughs> you don't really know, do you? <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Um, straight through there, then, is the mezzanine that takes us uh, into the brew house. We'll go downstairs this way. Um, so you can follow me. So most of our warehouse space is up the front here. This is where you'll come in at the front of the brewery. Um, just taking a glance down past our packaging line. Um, so those of you familiar with Bird will know we uh, pack it still in glass bottles, uh, two formats, uh, 330 and 500. Um, occasionally we do some 750s for uh, sort of mixed firm beer. Uh, this is the bottling line. Um, we can run roughly uh, 3,000 bottles an hour, I think, at like full rate. Um, two or three operators, depending on how fast we're running it. Um, someone loading, troubleshooting, and then packing and or stacking pallets at the other end. So still fairly hands-on. There's still one person packing those boxes at the end. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So nothing automated here. We're, we're very much in touch with the beer as we go. Um, and just follow me, we're going to the brew house. Just have the lab in here. On the left, so we do a little bit of uh, kind of analysis on the beers, all of our cellaring checks and stuff like that. Um, See all the stainless tanks here. So these are tanks for lagering in, and everything else here. I was about to say last time we came, when we pre-pandemic, these weren't here. Yes. So these are a relatively new addition, and uh, you'll see that we're doing some lagers now. And um, these tanks are just not rated for quite the pressure that we want to force carbon the beer. So um, that's why we got these guys in. And um, so we turn over our lagers in both of these. Um, Occasionally we'll do something else in there, and maybe that'll come up later. Um, but yes, we want to have force carb rather than um, the secondary firm, which we do with most stuff. Um, so this is one of our spaces. Mash and vessel here. Um, considerable infusion mash. Um, uh, this is the copper. So our brew lengths are roughly kind of 35, 36 milliliters in the kettle. Um, with liquor bag, usually we're turning out any. Between like 30 and 40 hectoliters of beer into each of these tanks. Um, hot liquor tank over here, um, hot liquor tank over here, um, which is all just you know squeezed in between the fermentation vessels, which are numbered from here uh, straight down to this end. Um, and yeah, so we have some more fermentation tanks next to them, which are for um, slightly different beers that we make. Um, so this is Arch 9. And this is where we do all of our mixed firm stuff. Um, so beer that's aged on fruit, um, beer that has anything other than a single clean brewer's yeast strain in it. So we will have, um, you can see the two uh, footers at the back, the large wooden vessels. Um, again, all the beer de saison um, that we make, uh, the footer beer, um, and uh, anything essentially that's going to have something a little bit more wild in it, keep it a little bit separate from the other beers. Are those, are those food is cleaned in between barrels or is there in between batches or is there kind of solera or thing around? There's, yeah, so we get, uh, not quite solera in the sense that like we will not, um, we'll not remove, all, we, we, we'll remove all the liquid, no. um, but yeah, they're not, uh, I mean, essentially they're hot rinsed basically in between. So there's there's native culture in there um, from what we fermented in them. And we do ferment a couple of different beer styles in there. So we do the um, uh, beer de saison um, and also the footer beer, which is a slightly different beer, it's a little bit a bit more bitter, a faster turnaround. Um, but yeah, a lot of the beer that will end up in uh, beer de saison that's either dry hopped or aged on fruit will have been in there and maybe blended with some stainless. So it's a, it's a very a kind of open approach to that, like how we choose to curate those beers. How the beer turns out depends on. Exactly, yeah. so we, we do a lot of tasting with that and deciding you know, where we want to take it depending on where the profile is. Um, so yeah, these tanks at the moment have uh, fruit in them. Um, 
mostly, so we've got some apricot here, some dams in here, ready to go. We're, we've just packed a beer that's uh, come out of there today. Um, and the other side of that um, is the barrel program that's in here. Quite cavernous, you probably hear a bit of an echo. Um, so again, this kind of wood side of the program is, um, it's predominantly Saison, but obviously we do page other things in barrels. We have some stout and things like that that we do occasionally. Um, all of these barrels are, um, well, they come from some quite desperate places. We have some whiskey barrels on the uh, top and towards the end here. We have some former wine barrels um, and at various different sizes. You can see we've got them at different periods. Um, so we'll decide how long we keep a barrel for, depending on how many fields it's had and what the beer coming out of it's tasting like. Um, and sometimes we retire them when we feel that's the right time to do it and bring some new ones in. Certainly we find that the bigger barrels we've gotten, um, I think, better result these more recently. So we're trying to move towards the larger size, more surface area contact. Um, so if we've got a bit of a few smaller barrels, which are quite historic recently, um, and a few more of these. Um, and a lot of this beer will end up in, again, those like kind of uh, mixed firm fruit beers or um, the, anything that's like under beer de saison. Um, basically, or uh, so is everything mixed up? There's food barrels, even like a whiskey. It's not some sort of barrel aged stouts, that are clean stouts coming out. Yeah, they're, they? they're they're clean when they go in the stouts yeah. when they go into the barrel. Um, I, after that, you know, it, obviously they have the native culture that's been yeah. in there. Um, we've had we did one stout in the uh, footer before. Well, it was a a stout porter uh, that was a, a batter porter recipe. Actually, I, I think it was from Durham Park Circle. Um, recipes. So we, yeah, we, we do play around with things a little bit, but mostly um, it really, we get different things from the barrels. So for example, these are Irish whiskey barrels that have come in, and most of these are filled with beer and saison at the moment, but we have just removed, so we first fill the stuff going into these. We have just taken out two, um, two barrels of stout, um, so, and that was the first fill in there. So that would be a classic barrel of stout, right. I think, um, in a lot of ways. But actually the whiskey barrels provide really interesting stuff. Um, cool. Well, I was an excited tour. We are now, I think, about to taste the beer de saison damson. Damson. I've even made damson. Damson. Yeah, right. damson. Uh, so we'll go back and give that beer a taste. So, tasting. Right. Well, what is this? Uh, what are you doing? Excellent stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Brad went a bit rogue there. Uh, I liked it actually. We it's pretty fun. I was, I was sort of trying to capture the sort of TFI Friday. Like nineteen nineties, ah. like crazy cameraman. Because it was nineteen yeah. ninety resolution. Yeah, 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 yeah. Younger viewers will not get that reference, but you know, for us, we're all quite happy with that. We don't have young, young, cool, hip viewers. Don't forget your toothbrush. Raised it. Uh, right, well, I hope you enjoyed that. If you've got any questions based off of that, uh, we've got a Q&A coming in, in yeah, about half an hour, or you can you can try your luck now, but we are about to crack... Johnny, have we had a single Super Chat? Uh, I don't think we've had a single Super Chat, although something oh, weird good. is going on with my stream yard. I can't, scroll, I can't scroll to the top to see... Usually you get a Super Chat alert at the This top. is like sort of only, only cans, right? We're, we're trying to <sighs> pimp ourselves here to the max. Maybe it's because we're in a railway tunnel. I know you're only bots, Brad. Every, <laughs> every meet, I'm waving a giant bottle over now. Every meeting we have, like creative meeting, me and Brad, we sit down, we go like, right, what do we need to do on the channel? What content? How, how are we going to make money out of this thing? Every time you're like, I can't believe only cans is gone. Because somebody's got it on Instagram <laughs> and you're like, I can't believe we missed that. Pretty upset about it. Yeah, but I, I tried to get it a couple of years ago and it was already gone. Yeah, you won't let it go. I won't let it go. A whole two Never years ago. ago. Wow. At yeah. least a couple of years ago. <laughs> yeah. and they're, not, they're not doing much with it. Are they? I only say, cans. If you only can's account, um, get in touch. Send me a <laughs> slide into my DMs and then <laughs> give me a password because I'd love that name. I think it's hilarious. Oh, my days. Right. Okay. So, uh, Beer de Saison Damson. Yeah, or as I pronounced it in the tour, Damson. 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 Let's get a close up of that bottle, Johnny. Damson. Oh, oh, need oh, oh, now. Yeah. <laughs> Damson. I have to. I have to oh, you have to like hide for everyone's faces. Wait, Bray, yeah, I can do it. I, I can do it. No, I think you need to do it. Yeah, that Same. Was really Look at that. Whoa. Oh, no. Now it's my face. Hide your face, Johnny. There from God. This is how TV works, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> so t tell me about Beer de Saison and then tell me about this one. Uh, yeah, so the Beer de Saison um, program or project is, uh, you know, we make a lot of different Saison beers here, um, and uh, they're all, uh, we have our own um, house culture, um, 
a kind of mixed fermentation. Um, so there, uh, for those viewers who are not fully aware of that, it's a it's a mix of um, brewers yeast, Saccharomyces, um, wild yeast, and also um, bacterial strains, and all of those things essentially work in concert together to ferment the beer, um, and they work at different times over uh, over a longer period. So these are beers that take a long time to produce. Um, they're very, very complex. They have a lot of different um, aspects to them. Um, the base work for the beer is um, uh, there's pale malt in there. Uh, we use Marisol in almost all our beers, but um, there's also oats and wheat in there. So mm. it's, um, you know, it's quite a kind of rich body I'm beer. Try, trying to, to keep some body once the bread's exactly. broken down and everything else. It's a hearty, nutritious breakfast of a beer. Absolutely. So you get that beer to say on word. That's, you know, that's some nice good stuff. Um, but yeah, as Johnny says, there's a lot going on in there. So, you know, you have the, the primary fermentation is mostly going to be the Saccharomyces that rip through. It's a Belgian strain. You know, it's, um, it's quite highly attenuating. Um, and then uh, there's a mixed culture of microbes in there. And not only that, some of this beer is, uh, I should have looked at exactly uh, what happened with this particular batch, but actually it, it's sort of in some ways irrelevant. Um, most of the barrel beer that, that most of the beer de saison that we produce from here will have spent time either in well in stainless um or wood or both um and then aged on fruit um so there's a lot of there's a lot of nuance that comes from that um and this beer changes gradually over time for that reason um when you get to the point where there is no longer any available sugar left in the the beer that um normal brewer's yeast or or even even wild yeast you know can chip away at you have microbes that chip away at that um you know the kind of breaking and they tend to break down um you know acetic acid that is produced and various other things and you get um you just get a, a beer that evolves and changes over time and i think that that for that reason you know these beers are great for aging as well um they're lovely when you when we first release them it's when we think that they're at their best iteration at the time when you you know you can really enjoy the fruit character but they also oh, change sorry. Over, sorry they also change over time and i think another thing to say about these beers is that any beer that spends any time in in, in wood or anything like that um by necessity there's a slightly oxidized quality that exists in the beer you know you're putting beer into like a barrel that breathes naturally by itself you know a barrel unlike a stainless steel tank is not entirely sealed it's not hermetically sealed you don't have uh, you know, you're not making it inert inside there. And so that oxidized character is actually something that really plays into the nature of these beers. Um, not aggressively so, but it's something to remember that. And this is much more, I guess, the way in which beers traditionally were made in the past. If you think that a lot of beer was put into, you know, kind of uh, wooden casks and barrels and stuff. So I think that we're, uh, and you look at the way the beer is uh, traditional, uh, lambic beer is produced, for example, and that mixed fermentation beer that has like such a um, a big presence in uh, kind of Central Europe. I think um, there are a lot of different iterations in this in different cultures, but we're looking at that a little bit as a model to you know how to produce these beers. There's um, <clears throat> there's lots of lovely comments in. Also, Moritz, the the greatest bartender I know. Uh, is yeah. also in the comments. Moritz uh, is on the socials. Yeah, yeah. Shout out, Moritz. Hello. Hey, Moritz. Hello, is friend. he still in New York? He's still in New York, Moritz. Are I you think back? He's back. I, I yeah. saw you the other day, Moritz. You are back. <laughs> he's back. He's, uh, his username is Moritz UK as well. Maybe that changes yeah. depending on where he is. He's international, baby. He's, <laughs> he's, he's, he's an international. He, he is. Yeah. He's field. He's fielding some comments. Somebody asked where the damsons are from. He thinks Hertfordshire. Oh. But most all the other fruit is Suffolk, East Sussex, Kent, or Tom Oliver's apples in Herefordshire. Would you agree? There are no apples in this beer, just to be clear. <laughs> yeah, sorry, he hasn't listed all the fruits in it. Where are the damsons from? No, I know. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. I know the name of the farmer who sends them to us. Where they're from, I couldn't tell you for certain. That's almost better. Um, like, if we say, where are these from? You go, it's from George. Dave. Okay, yeah, what was his exactly. name? Dave. Yeah. So, uh, Is it Dave? I think it's not Dave. No. Oh, okay. It's not Dave. We got damsons from a few different people, and then there was a bit of a there was a bit of a hiatus and various other things, and um, yeah. So we we we're, we're uh, the damsons are damsons are in decline, folks. Oh my god, oh, man! Come on, this is we have a punched in on the camera here. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about the plight of yeah. damsons in distress. Well, I think no, I think 
you know, um, the thing about fruit is it is it's exceptionally seasonal, um, and as everyone knows, and even more so than like if you think, you know, hops and that the hop growing programs are very well established um, mm. stuff now, particularly you know the big money programs for making you know North American or Southern Hemisphere hops. Um, but fruit, of course, is always uh, subject to the kind of changeable seasons and stuff like that. So I think these beers, I think very much we notice when the fruit comes in, um, uh, a character that comes from the fruit, you know, we'll eat the fruit roll when it comes in and we'll, we'll taste it and I obviously taste the iteration that comes out in the beer. But I think that um, the changing character over the season with fruit is what makes this beer very different every year. Um, and we love that about it. And it's like we said about the nuance that we talked about and that, that a certain expression that you get each time. So I think fruit is um, really important to these uh, beer de saison beers and um, uh, damsons are something we love from the start, but they are very different. Yet The one we have in tank now is incredibly different from this um, and, and by necessity, I guess. Are they? I, I don't know a lot about damsons, but are, you know, like apple trees, you can have. Uh, sing, it's amazing. I did a double air punch earlier because. Oh, for that comment. Is, sorry, no, no comment. I can't oh, see. I'm, oh, I'm blind. The damsons must be from Ted. Hey, hey. Ted hey. I see. I see. That's pretty it's good. Strong, strong, cheers. Yeah. Cheers Goodbye. to you, sir. <laughs> um, I've, oh yeah. Sorry. So, like apple trees can be like totally different. Every sort of wild apple tree can be a, a totally different kind of apple. I don't know anything about damsons. Is that the case with damsons? Like you're saying, they're quite different year to year. I think I can only speak from my experience of like getting them here, Brad. And I would say that, um, yeah, obviously, I, I have have I picked a damson from a tree before? I think I have at some point, um, but I wouldn't say that I've done it. You know, from one tree and one neighboring yeah. tree to be able to compare. Although I think any of our general understanding of like uh, you know kind of agriculture will kind of show us that the you know there are different expressions that come i think a lot about climate soil all those kind of things that we talk about terroir for example which is you know a, a word which is very uh prescient in wine all of the time and we have only maybe in the last four or five years stop, started talking about it in beer but i think that's important for beers like this it's important probably also in terms of hops for example as we're now seeing hops that have been you know, bred from European varieties in the US that are now being then produced in Europe. I think all of those things, um, I, I think it's a word that uh, beer drinkers should be familiar with terroir and not be scared of. It essentially is that particular expression of the the way that something comes from the particular environment that's produced in. And I think that's an important and do you, thing. And do you think, are you using like whole fruit damson? Like, is, it, is there yeah. yeast on the on the sort of skin of it? And like, of course, actually, stuff, the, like... and that's another aspect to it. So there will be, um, you know, natural cultures that exist on the skins of all of these fruits. And yes, they're aged on whole damsons. And quite often we will do... Uh, uh, second fills on fruit you know after we've macerated on the fruit for a while we'll take beer off and we put something else in and we find that's often a way particularly with stone fruits mm. to get more of the character from the stone um there's a lot if you think about the the flesh inside a fruit a soft fruit like that that breaks down very quickly essentially becomes juice and that becomes liquid in the beer that you are producing in there so you get a, a little bit of added yield and um, the skin is really really important so you know for example buying a puree or, uh, you know, just using juice doesn't cut it in terms of like producing a beer of this kind of complexity. Um, and similarly, the the stone inside in the center, you know, once you pull all that stuff away um, and you fill again, you're getting less of the kind of very overt juicy fruit character, but you're getting a lot of that kind of, you know, sort of almondy, like sort of very uh, interesting things that come from what's left over in there. Um, so, I mean, there's so much to be had from fruit and I think, um, it's a never ending thing in beer. Um, especially when you look at, uh, you tie that into all of the kind of fermentation and the, um, uh, natural process that are happening with like a symbiosis of microbes, varying yeast strains in there. Um, and all you really are as a, a brewer at that stage is a curator of that process. You're looking at it, you're tasting it, you're trying, you're, um, you're blending things together. Um, I, uh, and, that, and that's a hugely enjoyable experience to watch nature do what it does on those beers and, and, and get it to a place where, you know, people can enjoy to drink it in the glass. You're like a sort of yeast DJ. 
Sure, just just like spin, in the mix, just spinning in and just at the Literally right. Time. I, was, I, I was thinking of you know that epi- is it an episode of The Simpsons where Lisa accidentally births a whole new society in a petri dish? Yeah, oh, is that yeah. in The Simpsons? Well, that's also that's a, in that's Men in Black, isn't it? Yeah, it's in one of the Men in Blacks. Right. Oh yeah, that too. In the locker, where yeah, yeah, yeah. Society. Will Smith is a type. <laughs> yeah. Was that first or second? That he the Simpsons did it. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, maybe The Simpsons. I mean, they were both in the nineties. I'm not. really Yeah, I don't know which is first. Men in Black, the original one, is actually a great I think, film. I think we're, all, show, we're all showing our sun. era here, guys, with the references. <laughs> yeah. um, we, we were born in the mid to late 80s. Yeah. Don't tune out if you're in uh, Gen Z. Um, um, so, so tell me about the emojis I've chosen. A lot of people taking exception with the horse. I, there wasn't oh. a horse blanket. No, there is a little miciness to it, though. Which oh, I, if, if you had seen a wee mice, mousy. that would have been... Could, could it, mm. And the, 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 the blueberries were as close as I could get to Damson. Yeah. And what what is a Damson, for people that don't know? Uh, it's a British plum. It's a type right. of plum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there are over four hundred kinds of plum in the UK. A lot of plums about oh. me. Yeah. <laughs> is, is that is that South London? Is plum South London for something? Just call someone a bit of a plum, don't you? After a bit of Wally. All oh, right. Yeah. We we, we <laughs> did we didn't have that in Oxford. I'm afraid. Oh really? No. Um, well, you're very plummy. Uh, Oh, it's a plummy accent. I do know uh, that way. Yeah, yeah, there we go. Yeah, there we go. And then lemon for for acidity and. I do. I think. Yeah, I think that's a, that's quite nice. And also, there it there is actually quite a a pronounced sort of lemon acidity to this. I know people say that lemon is like quite a one note kind of thing, but I think. I, what I always say when people say that is that when your note is that zingy though, but that's all right. What I always say to people is like, you know, people go, "Oh, citrus like kind of zingy lemon." I was like. Take a lemon next to a lime. Yeah, they're very, very different. Very different. The, the, yeah. the two um, two classic yeah. foods yeah. we always have in the fridge, but they they're very different. Big time. You, sque- you, you squeeze. You they're squeeze. both in Sprite, though, aren't they? That, that yeah, is lemon and lime. lime. Yeah. That, a Sprite brings well, the unity up. of the together. together. You, 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 yeah. you squeeze a bit of lime over your Italian pasta. You know that that's going to taste different. Yeah. Yeah, but don't be doing that. No. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, over uh, pork tacos, though. Come on, there we go. This is a beautiful. No thing. other, no but other. no lemon on a pork taco. What are you doing? No, don't be doing that. Don't but, be doing that. Lads, though, gin and tonic, lemon or lime. Oh, oh right, either, either. Depends, I think depends on the top. Yeah, the, the kind of gin, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because I can taste the difference between gins. Anthony Honest. Gladman could. Tell Anthony us Gladman. Whole could. Sort of thing. We're going to give this. him a shout out for his gin book. Has he earned that? I don't. Know. I like him. He's a good lad. Oh, no, yeah, I like Anthony. Great. Just. Well, I like gin we, as well. We haven't even shouted out the fact that somewhere behind there is our book. There's our book. There it is. Available in uh, some bookshops. Uh, no, I don't <laughs> think so. It doesn't like it. It doesn't like it. Even, oh, even the Sony dear. cameras won't there, you there, go, go. there you go. Still, still in bookshops, but not in production. Not in production. <laughs> um, this has got, got so much history in this Jim, book, you man. Missed, there you, you go. Found there was any. Yeah, 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 yeah. There you go. Show, show them the good man, the good man Evan. There he is. The ledge. The man, the legend. And this book is full of extraordinary anecdotes about craft beer in 2016. It's not just a guidebook. It I think is... it's a timestamp. It is. On London, right? I think I even put that in the intro. Did you? I, I reckon I did. Oh, what's happened here? Good... You had some, uh, you've had some, uh, some mice, some mice well, in here. Happened, we had some visitors in here. <laughs> <Just> some some <laughs> camping in real works in London and not have that. Some um, very keen craft beer fans just want to taste a little bit of me and Brad's I'm glad to see that our book is tastier than uh, many of the others. There aren't that many. Well, the, 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 the Fire Homebrew book. Well, well I'm not going to stack that. few ones on the bottom of the thing. Yeah. Anywho, um, uh, who are we? Uh, where are we? Uh, support our channel. All of you, uh, Join our Discord. Uh, buy my latest book. Fortnum and Mason's Book of the Year, British Guild of Beer Writers Book of the Year, British Guild of Food Writers Your book of latest the year. current published book, not your latest. My, yeah, book. not my latest book, which actually is all about the history of beer and how it helped build society. So I think so I, I, I might enjoy that. I will be pre ordering yeah. a copy now, Johnny. I was actually, I was yeah. at Guinness <laughs> literally on Tuesday. You told me that you were in Ireland. Yeah, I'm yeah. very excited. I used uh, to work at uh, Guinness for a little while. Did you really? not, not in a brewing capacity. I was a student at the time, I was a theatre school student at the time. Um, but yeah, I uh, did some moving kegs and pouring beers and stuff when mm. I was. Uh, a in, young, a young man back in the day. Center. Yes, uh, the, that probably wasn't there back then, right? Not a bit. No, with, I mean we had the, the the Guinness Brewery experience, yeah, right. which is quite divorced from the Guinness Brewery itself. So. <laughs> uh, that was something I did note. Uh, you don't tour the brewery, really. No, there, there's a, glossy, a lovely water very feature. Glossy. Yeah. yeah. It's in a mad building, isn't it? It's quite expensive to do that. It's mad. I used to live it. just down the road from there, really? uh, St James's Gate, the other side of St James's Hospital. It's uh, yeah. It's. I mean, it, I, I had an incredible time. And, and briefly thought I discovered a secret about Guinness in, in that somebody said, that's the decoction tank. And I was like, 
What? Wait, Guinness Hang on, the they're going to shoot you in the head if you... Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's just a, a red dot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, unfortunately, uh, the decoction tank was there from when they used to contract brew Budweiser. And yeah. that's where the rice went. Oh, so go. Johnny's exclusive very quickly became Johnny's misinformation on Twitter. Um, Thank you. You'd already tweeted it. <laughs> yeah, I'd already yeah. tweeted yeah, <laughs> it. I'm, I'm hot on the button. I Here's am a, hot on the button. Guinness de- decoction right. tank. I, yeah. think, I think if we can say anything, we can say that Twitter is very forgiving. I think we should be yeah, agree yeah, with that. Ge- yeah, generally, they're just like, you know what? You made a mistake. It's a great place. We're all going <laughs> to move on. Right and then move on from it. Uh, Mr. Rougelot, who we have bought a beer in the past, so d- disclosure there, says, yeah, beer is a fantastic book. I keep reading it every month. I mean, great. it is. Some it people is great. read Lord of the Rings every year. He's reading that every I, month. I'm literally the J.R. Tolkien of, of, uh, of badly Tolkien. selling beer books. Uh, right. Okay. Let's move on to the final <laughs> beer of this evening because we're, we're, we're technically five minutes away from the Q and A. Here we go. Do the honors. You know Tony, gonna I'm gonna bloody. Uh, I'm gonna finish drinking this. It's so good. Yum yum yum. I love how you pick pick the camera shot that would have you out of shot mostly. Oh, I think I was in it. I think I was in it. But I like how we've all shifted this way slowly. I feel we like have, we, have, we have a little. I way. think so we, we have we have to brag. <laughs> Yeah, it's true. What's it's happened true. is the the vibrations yeah, right. of like, being in like, railway arts like, just moved everything. I've warmed up because I'm, I'm, because I'm looking at the I feel like I'm massively out of shot. Jesus, but I'm not. No, no, you're well in shot. I'm, very, I'm more in shot than any of you guys. <laughs> there you yeah, go, lads. There you go. Um, right, this is top ten beers in the world. For me. I have to say that before I ever worked at this brewery, this was always my favorite beer, mm. and it's by far my favorite beer that we. Uh, that we make here um and it took me a little while before you know on rotation uh, when i was working here before i got to brew this beer and um the first day i got to brew this beer was a really big day for me because i thought this is great i'm literally making the beer that i love to drink were, were you not nervous like a little what if i mess this batch up? absolutely because the, again you know well we talk about this beer now a little bit you know the kind of damage um, Domage, guys. Domage. Domage. Shout out Guinness Guru. Don't shout out Guinness Guru. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) But yes, uh, uh, lovely. The wonderful thing about this beer is, I think, and if you look at, you look at the head color on this beer, Mm. um, it's a beautiful, like, kind of, like, tawny, like, kind of slightly tinged head. I I describe it as a hobnob, sort of uh, medium brown head. Medium brown hobnob head. (laughs) It's not bad. Maybe, maybe ginger, like a gingerbread. I don't think you've got any of those <laughs> syllables right. <laughs> maybe a light, a light flapjack uh, sort of consistency. Light of flapjack. Color. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. That. Medium flapjack. I think the thing that that is really perfect about this beer is that it sits in the sweet spot between, um, you know, it's a it's a mm-hmm. it's a strong beer. That it's a rich, strong beer, um, but also it has a real drinkable character to it, um, and. By that I mean, um, you know, the alcohol is hidden well, it's masked well, mm. or, or perhaps not hidden, but it's just, it's incorporated into the beer in a way that makes it very, very easy to drink. Um, all of the richness that is coming from, and, and predominantly the character in this beer is malt. Uh, I mean, uh, it's very heavily hopped um, on the, uh, in the kettle, on the hop side. You know, a beer like this requires a lot of bitterness to get it to the place where you know it's not imbalanced but this beer as everyone will have seen um from if you've been drinking this for a few years or if you're just having it now it is based on an old recipe um a a, a traditional recipe and um you know i think when everyone first brewed this recipe it's uh you can see the rise the reason why it works everything is in concert really well in the beer and one of the big things about these old london stouts the, the most important malt in the beer really is the brown malt or coffee malt as some people call it there's a very particular uh way that the grain is uh roasted and milled quite finely that really creates a lot of that um roast character that kind of like that you would get in roast coffee like kind of um a lot of the bitterness in this beer also comes from the malts you know we have uh we have chocolate malt in here which give that kind of rounded character um uh we've got crystal malt um both kinds of crystal, like uh, light and dark crystal, that give it like a kind of sweetness and a richness to it. Um, and uh, it's 
for that reason, I think it just has a lovely, lovely balance. Um, it, <clears throat> Can I just, th this comment is, but it smells like Belgian chocolate, tastes like Italian espresso, feels like cream. That's a great comment. That's bang on. That's a really great comment. Not just any. <laughs> no, 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 don't, don't cheapen it, Bradley. Um, That's a good comment. Good comment. <laughs> talk, talk to me, talk to me about this head, because... And how long that lasts. Yeah, how, how is that created? Because, you know, that is like, I mean, Brad and I were, were at Budvar. Come on, Brad, hide our faces. <laughs> Everyone hide your face in shame. Oh, thank there we you, go. the beer there we gods. Go. We found it. Look at that. I mean, it's beautiful. That has been hanging around for a good while. What a what a great head. Could, like for for a Czech beer, you'd mm. need you'd need your side pull tap. You'd need a proper tap so that knows how to do. You need a perfectly clean glass. I think it's it's all that essentially the the the, the head retention of beer is uh, as you guys will have talked about a lot, and, and some of your viewers will know. Is all about the protein essentially in the in the beer and. Um, I, the head can really only ever form once, and this is really why you don't want to. This is why you want to gently produce beer at all other parts in the process, because the more that you foam up any point in time, is like the more that you break up those proteins, and that they can't continue to produce that matrix, which gives you that lovely head in there. Um, and uh, you know, with all of these kind of uh, big malts in here, there's there's potential for that that head to last for a long time, and that's why you know. Nitro beer looks great, for example, because, you know, the very, very fine bubbles in nitrogen really push up into like a kind of creating a fine knit head on a beer. Um, and those beers, when they're like poured on draft with nitrogen, look incredible for that reason. And a similar reason, I guess, behind sparklers on cast beer, um, that you're really kind of pushing something into a really tight knit kind of place. You're pushing like very small bubbles through. There are some arguments against that also as well, of course. Um, but uh, ultimately, the aesthetic, and we talk, I talked about this a little bit earlier, but um, I very, at a quite young age fell in love with the aesthetic of like kind of light on dark and like kind of a, a head on beer and the, the understanding of like that, that kind of difference between, you know, how on earth could a liquid that is this color have bubbles on <laughs> yeah, the top? I remember that this blowing color. my mind. It's just, it's, it's quite incredible. Um, and I think there, there's, there, there was a fascination with that for me always. Um, and I think there's a whole generation of people who grew up um, and what, looking at something like Guinness, for example, which is like, you know, the market leader in the, the, the kind of, well, a, a market leader in a lot of places, but certainly <laughs> the market leader in, in terms of, um, you know, draft start beer um, and kind of seeing that brand as a drink within itself. A lot of people don't know that Guinness is a stout. They just know it's Guinness. You know, they want to go buy that. And we're not here to promote Guinness or anything else, but I think that's the power of uh, what I'm saying is their aesthetic marketing, which is based on that juxtaposition of like two colors in a glass. Um, and it, it's, that's quite an incredible thing. And, you know, similarly, this, although I actually really enjoy the fact, so the, the, depending on, you know, uh, what malt you use, you can you're going to end up with a darker colored head depending on like what you're using. There's some black pit and malt in this, which gives you a, a dark colored head. Um, uh, some people will use roast barley, which actually is unmalted barley, um, so it's just roasted till it's like uh, you guys will know this is roasted, um, but it's not malted first. Um, and there's a certain argument that kind of goes, well, maybe there's really no point in malting it um, if you're going to you're ro roast, roast the shit out of it anyway. Yeah. Um, uh, sorry, that's uh, maybe not a word that I should use on live stream. It's okay. Um, actually... I'm amazed that's the first time in. Yeah, so sorry. Yeah, it's, uh, good, sorry. <laughs> if you use it in the first oh. minute, it's a trouble. It's it's an issue. It's a trouble. Okay, it's happening. It's a trouble. It's an issue with the algorithm. We're, we're, we're and you didn't even uh, give me a heads up about that beforehand, but I'm glad that I didn't. Yeah, no. I, 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 wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't straight, straight out the gate. But, um, uh, yeah, <laughs> we're on the last beer, so yeah. I think we're all right. Can we just talk about aesthetic marketing? You were just talking about it with Gears. Yeah, it's a good point. A good time to raise yeah, it, I think, because a... you know, you guys, you've never changed your branding ever. You've you've changed this... the size of the yeah, world, maybe, the, the maybe, the kernel. maybe. I think that's it. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, Evan struck on something really good when he did this, and I think um, uh, having not directly ever spoken to him about this, but and so I, I won't presume to put words in his mouth, but I would suggest that a lot of the idea is about letting the liquid in the bottle speak for itself. Yeah. Um, and 
it was it's a simple aesthetic um which in its own way has become a brand um it, there probably was no attempt to do that at the time but at the end of the day it's um uh it's also not a lot of people say to me oh the colonel's anti-branding i don't it, it's not anti-branding either it is it is what it is because it came up at the time that it did and it came from the place that it did and it is very much just a um just an expression of what was born at that period of yeah. time. And there has been no reason to change it yet. No. And I'm sure there'll be some questions and we'll come up to those. Um, and again, I, I'll field them as best I can in the sense that um, uh, I'm not the owner of this business, but um, as someone who's very, very invested in it, um, I can, I can only speak to all the things that I love about it and the things that I, um, uh, that I see in it, I guess. There's, there's an honesty, there's an integrity to it, you know, like yeah. not, not, you guys, I think, as a brewery, you don't sort of like jump on bandwagons ever. You've never jumped on a bandwagon. I don't, I don't remember you making a sort of uh, Nipah or anything along those. Lines. Maybe you have. I don't know. But no, we just made a Hopfen Vice recently, uh, ten years late. So um, ten, that's it. I mean, uh, like you guys, late, uh, whatever. Um, you're like the you, you guys can try that in the tap room later. <laughs> yeah, <isn't> it? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's that's amazing. Like you know, you don't feel there's a conf I think there's a confidence in the branding in that you got it right at the beginning. Um, or it, you know, it, it's it has honesty and integrity. You've never felt the need to change it. Like you don't feel the need to jump on the latest. Sort of I, I think that's a good way of putting it, Brad. I think there's a, there. I've heard a few comments from people uh, at various points in time over the years who've said it's a bit. Uh, you know, there's the anti-branding thing, or there's the like kind of you know, screw you. I don't care if you buy my beer, kind of thing. It'll do what. And I, it's clearly never been that it's just it is what it is yeah. it, it it is there and, and it's there it's produced it's something produced with passion and with love and it's packaged in the way that kind of says this is the thing that you're getting exactly. do you want this thing yeah and i get that um if you uh, and it's not like i'm not um drawn in by any of these things the beautiful artwork and like our wonderful like kind of can aesthetics and stuff and it's like you know I'm in this industry. I'm, I'm here with all of you guys. I've taken the whole journey over the last 10 years. So I know exactly all of that stuff and I, I'm part of it as well. But it's just, it's kind of saying, we're here. This is what we do. Um, if you're interested in this thing that we have, um, then perhaps you'd like to try it. And if you've had it before, then we hope you like it. I think, I think, I think a really powerful brand is when it matches... When, when the brand is an extension of, you know, the philosophy of the product that's made mm -hmm. of the people that make it, because then it all kind of makes sense. When it's beautiful packaging, terrible product, suddenly the, the beautiful packaging doesn't make as much sense or looks kind of fake. And what's brilliant yeah. about Kernel is everything that you make is incredibly honest and simple. Even if mm -hmm. the flavors are complex, you know, it's, it's, never, it's, it's always style, not fashion. It's yeah. always history, not, not like the kind of the, the cycles that craft beer goes through. And that's why I think the branding's also lasted because it's, it's all of those things. And somebody's also just pointed out, so we'll pick up this. It's the same coloration as well. So you've got, you've yeah. literally got the export stout that's in bottle. Pretty, that's a pretty excellent shot. Yeah, yeah. it really is. Um, um, I, I would argue that it is beautiful packaging as well. Yeah. I think, you know, sometimes the simplicity of things, you know, it's like you, you look at these like kind of classic fashion lines that are, you know, they're very, you know. It has. It's like it's like elegant. a they're Chanel elegant. number five or yeah. something. It's timeless, right? That's right. That's got that. That's great. I think it smells great, better than like Chanel it. number five. Maybe no Chanel number five smells pretty good. Does anyone know what Chanel number five smells? No like? idea. Old ladies, old rich oh, ladies. Yes, yeah. It's yeah. too expensive for me to have ever smelled Maybe a bit it. of wee. Like, I'm going to Paris in a couple of weeks. I'll see if Why? I can sniff like Just go sniff some Chanel number five. Then, uh, yeah. Sniff some old ladies. I'll be at a beer festival. I don't think there'll be anyone with drinking Chanel or drinking Chanel. I'm no, no, no. Oh, wow. I mean, it's pretty alcoholic. <laughs> Probably, uh, you know. Maybe that Maybe that will be a collaboration <laughs> that never should have happened. We'll just put a bit of that in. I think, I think, there's, I think there's a deeply, intrinsically wonderful thing about Colonel um a confidence and a sort of an honesty that is all you know it's it's unchanging you know like this is a stall of london craft beer it has never felt the need to change what it looks like and, and it, i think that's that's it, amazing it's not like just to point out it's not like 
the brewery hasn't changed and evolved. And I think the no, brewery, no, no, it's the not brewery about would, the brewery. No, no, I know, yeah, I know yeah. you, you weren't, but I was just going to say that I think that over the years, I think um, you guys are like the most sort of forward thinking. Change is incremental here. And, yeah. and again, I say that as like someone who's been associated with the brewery for a number of years, but I, uh, you know, only recently been employed. But I think that um, the nice thing about it is like nothing is reactionary here. Yeah. Mm. No one looks at something and goes, shit, we need to do that. Or, you know, whether it be market trends or this, that, or the other, um, whether it be changes in the way that we do things and process and everything. And there's a, there's a massive respect for one another amongst all our colleagues, you know, from, uh, you know, from Evan to, to everyone else who is working here. And I think we, it is a, a massively collaborative and cooperative place to work. And I think we take our time to figure out how we can share our knowledge and experience to make things better, to produce something that ultimately we hope is evolving as time goes forward, but also producing something that, Yes, we like, but we want other people to drink and enjoy as well. Just waving at Andy Parker there. There's there's a there's a, a sort of utilitarian, cooperative, almost like you know a kind of like a, a, an army might move quite slowly, kind of thing. Like you know, like I, I, I don't know where I'm going with that. But Keep going. Maybe mate. not these you know, like, you, <laughs> you, <laughs> medieval times. That what we're talking well, about. Maybe I'll go to medieval times. But like <laughs> you, you kind of look at sort of um, utilitarian workwear or something, and it's functional. And it's, you know, like, you know, you've, you've made choices about the, you know, the color of the, of the glass, you know, it's bottle fermenting stuff. You're doing what you're making all these decisions and you're sticking with them. And it's not about fashion or anything. It's just about the best expression of those beers that you're making. And I think you've, you've, you've stuck with it over the years. I'm, gl I'm glad you feel that way. And certainly, you know, that's the way that I feel about the business. Absolutely. I'm pretty drunk now. <laughs> so weirdly, the I mean, I know it's seven point seven point this something percent. Four, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm feeling a little bit rosy cheeked at this point, so I think it's a great time to bring in somebody who's fresh faced and definitely hasn't been drinking along with us, which is uh, the wonderful Lewis from Bruiser, who has some questions from uh, the uh, the Bruiser community. We will also, as soon as those questions have been asked, be asking. Uh, you guys for questions at home so if we haven't got to your question during the show uh, do please start listing them I will be tracking them we're going to shuffle along yep yeah, of yep. course we're going to go for a week my arse is taking up way too much space go <laughs> on right, getting out of this oh yep right, arse is fine arse is, arse is fine right <laughs> Welcome, Lewis. I'm definitely not really cheeks and haven't been drinking a lot. So. There you go. See? Proof. Same Proof's in the pudding. Brad, uh, Brad's taken the well, opportunity you, to literally run away. I, one away. Oh, my God. Are you okay? No. Fine. Okay. One in, one out. <laughs> one in, one out. <laughs> okay. I've got this. Just another half hour, Jay. <laughs> Jay. Never called myself that easy. <laughs> uh, right. So, uh, welcome Hello. to the Craft Beer Channel live stream. Thank you. Things are going okay. Um, Chris has Chris has really held this together. If I'm honest, he's carried the show. Yeah, he, uh, okay, that's, he you're, show. you're not supposed to say that. Sorry. Um, Wish. <laughs> so you guys very kindly did the facilitated this whole thing yes. uh, by bringing us on and, and, and doing the boxes, um, and you've spoken to people who can't be here tonight. Some people are out there. Think, you're not quite sure. are. We kind of asked for some questions in advance um, in case they couldn't be here tonight. Uh, but yeah, ask for some questions. We've got some great questions. Uh, and actually that segue from the branding uh, mm. is quite a good one. We've got can we, can we just say that Lewis has uh, handwritten these questions um, because the printer's on the blink. So to, to this, that is, camera. this is what he's gone through to ensure that you guys get the answer to your questions. So um, let's yeah. proceed. No, yeah, we're, we're, everything's old school here, so we uh, we thought we'd keep. keep Indeed, yeah. yeah as yeah. as a digital business, you thought, you know what? I'll <laughs> handwrite this to show people what we can do. <laughs> right, keep coming. Brad's <laughs> back just in time. Um, yes, yeah, so to, to carry on with the segue of branding. Um, oh, we lots, move. Lots yeah, of Ferguson. people asked about branding, um, and I think that what, what I want to say, I would just echo Johnny's comments about the fact that I think the best brands in the world uh, result from the best products, um, and you don't need, you know. But if you walk into a bottle shop now and you see kind of bottles, you know exactly uh, what they are. That's because the product's so good um, for my two cents. But um, we talked about the inspirations for that and you know why, why that came about. But specifically bottles, can you just talk a little bit why bottles and would you ever consider canning? Why not? Yeah, that's a great one. And it's not um, it's not an alien comment to us. Um, I guess it's something that we're asked um, all the time. 
Um, the first thing to say is the bottle is part of the aesthetic. Um, as Brad pointed out, it's like, you know, you know, the color of the bottle and uh, obviously brand bottles are, anyone who knows anything beer, about beer will understand that that's important because of, you know, potential light damage to beer. I never understood how Miller get away with putting beer in clear bottles. It's you know, the, mad. When we've it's talked mad. about this on channel, some people like it's supposed to taste like that. Yeah. You know, even if they put it in brown, they'd make sure that flavor was still there. Well, I remember key. drinking MGD in bottles as a as a teenager. And I, I mean, I thought that beer was great. Um, but I mean, now I realized that what I was tasting was absolute skunk, mm. like, you know, back then. But I guess I was into it and, um, and that's fine. Um, so I would say that, number one, it's part of the aesthetic, the bottle. Um, the other thing to say for um, for people to understand is that, like, uh, you know, kind of smaller producing craft breweries, um, infrastructure is a huge thing. And, um, you know, having invested when we did in the bottling line at the time and, you know, kind of uh, being able to produce bottles uh, in the way that we do that I think is, uh, you know, gives them great stability um, and shelf life. Um that's not a small undertaking in terms of um, how much it costs. So economically, but also like the kind of uh, physical idea of, you know, kind of changing everything over. So I would say, and now again, I won't speak for anyone else in the brewery and I can't speak directly for Evan on this, but I would suggest that it's not necessarily a reticence towards cans. We all know that there's a lot of research that suggests that cans in fact are um, in terms of long-term stability and, uh, are potentially better for um, looking after beer long term, but it's not something that we're able to do right now. Uh, over time, it may be something that changes eventually, and that'll be a choice that the brewery makes. But again, it's an infrastructural change that will take a little bit of time. And as with everything with the kernel, we'll take our time and think about it before we do it. Um, cans and four forty mil cans have been around in you know craft brewing for five seven years now, you know, and going strong. Um, so uh, we're not in a rush to do it. I always speak of the, uh, when I think of the Colonel, I always speak of the uh, Ents and the Lord of the Rings. This is the second time Lord of the Rings <laughs> quite recently. It's like, you know. I'm, I'm you guessing got, you're a Lord of the Rings fan. You've got you to have, uh, <laughs> have a moot for a while before, yeah. you, um, before you consider like making any kind of serious change. And I think that, I think that actually is quite a good thing. We talked about non-reactionary um, changes to things. Bottles, yeah, for sure, are not the norm in craft beer anymore. So the answer is, in short, we're not averse to cans. Um, certainly, I'm not averse to cans, but I think a lot of things would have to be considered about aesthetic, but also about infrastructure before we would change. I can't imagine what a can, the kind of can would look like uh, either. So somebody's just said that. It's like, would would you would would that just be on the can, or would you extend? So I've, I've got a 1950s American um, Army issue boss, uh, can of water. Oh, the emergency you, drinking water I can. I going to say it was stew in a can. I mean, it, it <laughs> probably <laughs> is at this point. Yeah. Yeah. It's probably rust stew in a can <laughs> at this point. But I imagine like the aesthetic of that is very similar to this. It's like utilitarian... I think highly the, functional. I think the answer great, is that we, yeah. we'd have to rethink the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And we do have um, yeah, travesty. The NRC travesty. One, one of our Colonel and Cam. Colonel and Cam. Brad's come out and said it. If you haven't noticed, one way. of our employees is a, is an incredibly talented artist, and I don't does, care. He does some art, <laughs> he does he does some art, artwork for some other breweries that you may know, but um, uh, so. I imagine there will be a lot of consultation. Do you ever catch him just scribbling on the Colonel bottles before they go out? If you haven't noticed, uh, Johnny, Brad, and I have come as Colonel Bottles tonight. Uh, we, oh, yeah. We're pretty, yeah, uh, very yeah, yeah, pretty yeah, 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 Everyone's like, there's a yeah, slight yeah, army yeah, right. Yeah, I'm yeah, like, oh, yeah. is this, the, is this, we're, we're in a bunker. Not, you know, Did yeah. we just all we're go to a place sale, sale, sale <laughs> and <laughs> kind of hop, hop, <laughs> tunes, isn't it? Right then. Oh, here we go. Yeah, you didn't get the memo because we're organized enough to send memos and retro. What can we do? Hit me with another question. Another question. Okay, so this is from Scott. It's a bit of a two parter. And I guess he actually framed the first part to everyone, um, so Brandon Johnny as well, and then the last bit was just for, for Chris. So how do you see the wider landscape of craft brewing evolving in the next decade? Oh, my God. <laughs> a long time, <laughs> given what's happened in the last We don't know what's going to happen next week. Uh, no, we'll, we're going to bring that to the, the, the near future, but, you know, what's, how is it going to evolve? Um, and in that context, Chris, what's one of the biggest challenges that you see going forward for the Colonel's fresh beer philosophy? 
Yeah, I mean, I'll let these guys talk a little bit after this. I, I would say um, it's a really interesting one, like having been through, um, you know, the last decade of uh, craft beer in, in the UK, so much has changed. I mean, I think it, we're talking about two years on two years. I think of I think of maybe like three or four periods of like my experience in working in beer and producing beer over the last 10 years. Um, and they all have their own character in a way. Um, and I, I'm, good, I'm trying to think of a way to describe them now because they have a certain snapshot in my mind of experiences that I've had um, in that period. But I think one of the big challenges, I think probably for craft beer going forward is um, something that maybe dogged the whole industry at the very, very beginning, which we're all trying to fight with it in, you know, 2009, 2010, what is craft beer? And I think with the, the bigger, like kind of push of micro companies into those kind of spaces where um, uh, smaller independent breweries are, um, how to really stake your claim on what it is that you do and w why it can differentiate itself from other you know, kind of products that are out there on the market. And um, uh, I don't, it's not something new. It's not something that, uh, and it's something that's very obviously relatable to many different industries. And it, I think it's, uh, we, we've already seen the model in, in the US for, um, you know, years before it was even here, you know, kind of through the 80s and 90s before it, it came here. But I think that with the economic crisis the way it is, um, as sad as it is for everyone, I think it's tough for a lot of small businesses in a lot of ways. So I think um, I think my prediction is we will see less smaller um, breweries starting out in the way that they have done over the last decade, um, which is a shame. Um, uh, and I, I will see we see a lot more breweries like kind of, I guess, trying to batten down into their core demographics of people who want to buy the beer and I guess catering more to those um you know we we don't really want to be a brewery that is uh producing beer you know just for a set group of people we want to be we, it, it was always designed to be you know kind of producing exciting beer that would interest people um and I hope that will still be the case. And I think in a city like London, for example, that's still an option because, you know, London will always be uh, on the upward trend. It will always be a vibrant city that's, per, you know, having people interested in uh, more unique things. Um, so, but I think it's going to, I'm not going to lie, I think over the next like five or six years, it's going to be difficult for breweries in smaller places in the UK to try and really push forward and entrench themselves in some cases to get forward. But I, I would urge everyone to like go out and support. If you really like drinking good craft beer, go out to your bottle shops, go out to your local brewery tap rooms, buy direct from them, whatever you can do. Because I think, uh, and, and this is not an advert in any way, I'm trying to suggest that ultimately all of us who care about beer, I think we should really be supporting it in that way because all of these small businesses are just that they are small businesses and they need people to to come out and support them and if we love to drink beer and you want the beer to be there on your doorstep go do it um i love beer so do you let's drink more of it there was uh, i can't even remember who said it to me but there's there's a really big moment for me where i really <clears throat> understood the importance of supporting small business which was somebody said that if you go into a, a little shop a little independent shop and you buy something, whether it's like a little corner shop or whether it's like a little fashion, expensive fashion boutique, when you buy something, somebody has a little celebration goes either like amazing or thank God, you know, and, and that's not something you get when you drink even a brilliant product like Guinness. You're never going to get that yeah. kind of feeling. And I think that that's a really special way of making drinking alcohol drinking well drinking anything but making it feel special this idea that every time you buy a bottle of kernel especially a, a bottle of export stout or a non-mosaic ipa chris is like cool <laughs> I, get, I get a little smile and that's <laughs> that's all i need guys. you just feel it even if it's miles away <laughs> yeah, just like, yeah. oh, somebody bought a kernel uh so yeah i mean <clears throat> Yeah, I, I agree with everything that you've are, um, are breweries said the new record shops are they are they in danger and we need to support our local They do fine now, record shops. That's a good They do yeah. what? They do all right now. Well, yeah, because there's record store days. People are even buying tapes. I, I 
Yeah, I mean, I've got tapes. I don't buy tapes. Pe- people buy yeah. tapes now. They're like, oh, yeah, I want to do that. Yeah, yeah, you know, Johnny, I've still got sure. VHS tapes I've kept, like special ones. Oh, Not like go. pornos. I can oh, get I got got <laughs> Nobody has like, seen that one. I've got, like, <laughs> yeah. I've got, like, sort of, like, classic... <laughs> I've got, like, classic horror movies and, like, Aphex Twin uh, music videos but, and stuff like but that. But do you still have a VHS player to watch them on? VHS in my player. loft. Yeah. They're not on the rack. You're, you're not sticking it on. You're not coming on a Saturday night being like, hey, yeah. you're not going to... Tell you what, tell ask, he's going to get straight me, on his ladder to get his VHS thing. And ask me how off. many uh, cathode ray tube televisions I own. Well, how many is it? I think it's about five or six. <laughs> Brad, Brad's what home, else are you hoarding? <laughs> I'm a hoarder. Is like, yeah, I am a massive hoarder. Have you, uh, there's, there's an amazing museum in Berlin. It's the museum of like... Eastern Berlin and how people yeah. live. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah, what yeah. Brad's house is like. I kind of like that, yeah. It's kind of like <laughs> You've yeah. seen the inside. I've you seen. know the depth. Yeah, also, yeah, Brad's yeah. brain is a lot like the DDR Museum <laughs> in Berlin. Uh, any other questions? Yes. yes. Sorry, okay. One more, shall we? Uh, so, um, this is from Ben, and it's for you, Chris, specifically. Double Citra was one ah. of his favourite uh, craft beers at the start of his craft beer love affair. Uh, double Scans reminded him of how good a dipper can be. Is there any particular reason why so many, uh, sorry, so few double IPA releases? Uh, and please, can we have more? Um, y- yes, and yes, I think um, is the answer to that. I think uh, so. Part of it is that um, we, as we talked about, second secondary fermentation, we bought conditional lot of beers, um, and uh, and this was just before I worked here, but um, there were. Uh, and I also, I will join you in saying that Double Sitter was uh, a, a beautiful beer at the time when we all really loved to drink double IPAs. Um, and I guess uh, there, there's still a, a massive place for that beer in the market. I think it's a, um, it's a wonderful expression. The double IPA is probably the best expression of a kind of full-on hop character that you can have. Um, and it's, it's a lovely luxury beer to have. Um, so I, I remember Double Citra well and loved it very much. Um, I think one of the things is that we struggle with um, uh, the secondary fermentation on the um, really, really, really big alcohol beers, you know, beers that are like kind of 8 9%. It's quite hard to get that to work um, because you struggle in that that uh, kind of high alcohol content thing. So sometimes uh, I think there were a few uh, failed goes at making double IPAs in the interim after that beer was released um, that didn't quite work. And the project, shall we say, was shelled for a little while after that. Um, and now that we have these tanks that we use to produce our lager in, and also I think there's 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 a duality to this because um, now that we... Um, have these tanks and we can produce a beer in there we can force carbonate the beer um so the most recent double scans was a forced carbonated beer but at the same time actually one of the things that we kind of considered was that the thing we talked about earlier about the um sort of uh secondary fermentation and that like those extra top notes that come from producing a beer in that way were probably not necessary for beer that was so highly hopped and all of the character was about the hop in the same way that we're talking about the pills, it was like, you know, when that beer has been dry hopped and is ready to go, we can force carbon and get it out the door. And that's when it's the best to drink. And it doesn't benefit necessarily from that uh, kind of extra kind of fermentation period. Um, in fact, if anything, as you discussed before, Johnny, it can, it can end in a like kind of degradation to a certain degree. So, the impetus to do it again was that us having the facility to do it. Um, will we do it again? I'm almost certain we will. Um, uh, it might not be a regular stalwart, but you can see that there are beers that we produce, you know, kind of um, seasonally, uh, once, thrice a year or whatever. Um, and then there are the beers that we produce regularly. So you will see another double IPA from the Colonel for sure. And, uh, is that a threat or a project? <laughs> I, 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 I say, I say, we will see a double, um, double IPA. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There was, was a quick follow up from Ben, and I know he's uh, he's also uh, online viewing this. So, hello, Ben, and thanks for the questions. Um, okay. He recently had, or he had at your tap, uh, your food of beer, Wild Citra. Uh, he was asking if you'd be bottling it. Next time, because he said it was utterly glorious, was the, the word that he that, used. The, uh, Yeah, that, that, that beer is a, a, a fan favourite. Um, there's a lot of people who have come around and really enjoyed that beer. And um, no, unfortunately, that beer's all 
done and dusted. Um, and it was kind of the result of a, a, a very, you know, kind of, uh, we may do something similar again, but I, I can't, I can't suggest that um, uh, we can, certainly we won't be putting it in bottle anytime soon. I'm sorry, but please do come back to the tap and have some. We have, we have a few kegs. Um, thanks, Ben. That was it from the, uh, from, from the Bruiser community. community. Well, we, we've got some questions coming in. Uh, we've got about 10 minutes left. So uh, Declan Walsh asks, will we see more malt forward beer due to economic conditions and climate change? And will they be historic or a new way to use malt? Um, I think we at the Colonel have, are, are very interested in malt forward beers anyway. Um, for anyone who's seen some of the output we've done recently, you know, we've just made a bitter, we've just made a dark mild. Um, again, these are based on the tradition of the way that we do things. These are based on old school recipes that we take. We tweak them to fit our kit, but, and, and we talk about how they're, you know, how we're going to make them a little bit ours, shall we say. Um, but like I said to you guys before, that's one of the things that I have a great passion for is that kind of understanding the importance of beer to uh, society over years, the kind of social history of it and all of that. Um, so yes, I think, I think malt forward beers are very, I, I will say to you guys for certain that when I go to the pub outside of big work, and obviously, you know, we, we can drink beer at work and stuff, and it's obviously we drink the beer we make and we love it and stand behind it. When I want to go to, to the pub to drink beer, I drink cast bitter a lot. I drink a lot of cast bitter from a lot of different producers. And, um, and I think I understand why that beer is a beer that has, you know, essentially you know fueled an industrial revolution and all that kind of stuff it's a um you know those kind of beers sustain people um they uh, you can have quite a few of them um which is nice if you're going out to have some time with friends but also uh they have a richness of flavor um and that peak you just enough and just just a beautiful kind of amount of bitterness that takes you through and a sweetness the balance is perfect um that don't it doesn't override your palate but you can keep going with them forever so i you know i could talk about malt forward beers forever i, I absolutely love them um and but uh, johnny has a whole review on them i'm sure that you can see of like you know, <laughs> the ones you can drink a bottle or you can go and get on cask so yes i think malt forward beers will never go out of fashion um as long as we can continue the tradition of cask beer in the uk which i think is very very important um so, you know, get out and drink good cast beer. I think it's a big reason why really malt four styles never really took off in the US. And even when they did, we started pastrifying them quite quickly <laughs> because actually the <laughs> absolute best format for malt forward beer is in cask, right? It accentuates those flavors, adds complexity yeah. to those flavors and retains drinkability uh, in those styles as well. So, um, you know, I'd, I'd be, the, the issue, it, like, it would be great if there were more malt forward styles. It would probably be, a cheaper way to produce beer, although malt has gone crazy in terms of price compared to what it was, but it's yeah. still cheaper than making a uh, a very hot forward beer. But you know the 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 issue is that car scale itself is is in severe decline and really struggling. So the best format for it is struggling when actually it would be a good solution for lots of us to to make them. So it's it's helped in one element and and really harmed in another yeah and i think that it's like you know I, I mentioned earlier on the of the stream that we are making cast beer at the kernel but you know we are not the kind of brewery that we're not going to be the game changer that it kind of you know because we make beer on cast ultimately it's like who's going out into the pub to drink cast beer and so many times when i go to my local pubs or places in my local area to drink cast beer particularly for people in like kind of our demographic of the like kind of 20 to 40, 20 to 50, uh, it's very, very hard to see a lot of people drinking those beers compared to people who will just have, you know, a kind of lager on, on draft because it's just there. And I think the more that we kind of normalize that and make that a thing again for people to go out and actually want to drink cast beer, the better it will be when you have it because when it's shit when you have it, it's because no one's had it for four days but and you've come into that pub and uh, they're hanging on to it because they want to make money out of it and stuff. And there's, a, there's a lot of stuff around that, but um, I think the more that we go out and drink it, um, the better it will be. Yeah. 
Uh, right, we're, we're the, the questions are absolutely free-flowing now, so uh, okay. apologies if I miss any. People have been commenting about how I look like I'm, I'm uh, going ghost on, I think somebody said. It's because I'm watching all the comments coming in. Well, you're um, going to shoot us all up, Johnny. Uh, <laughs> it's very hot. Yeah. Even though it's not, it's, it's not hot. It's, it's, it's not it's the the we're hot. Style, yeah, isn't it's the yeah. Style, yeah. Um, They're all very red faced, but don't worry about that. When, when, I, when I went for a wee, Johnny... Go on. Um, there was a mosquito on the wall, and I tried to squash it, and I missed it. And then it flew at me and like tried to attack me. It went under my shirt as I tried to exit Man, the room. That's that's the Colonel House mosquito. Is that it? Oh, I Jerry, tried, the beast. I tried to, I tried to kill, I tried to murder him. I tried I to murder him. Having said, we've got a million comments again for you. Like I'll tell the mosquito story now. <laughs> I kept it pretty short. I didn't see Wayne as for the double IPAs after this, right? Uh, while I find that we've we've had a super chat, but while I find that, what's the beer that you have made that you're most proud of? Oh, that's a um, good one. Doesn't specify Colonel, but yep. let's stick okay. to Colonel. Uh, I uh, the um, the first iteration of the bitter that we made, um, which is based on an old Simmons recipe from 1880. Um, myself and my colleague Ben um, worked together on that recipe, and when that when that beer first came out, um, I was I was really delighted by that beer. And actually, as it happens, we've done a second iteration, which is even better. But when that beer first came out, and I had that on cask in the in the tap room, I was absolutely delighted with that beer. It was a a really a wonderful experience. And the, the staff will tell you because I stayed in there till close and had about four or five pints. <laughs> <in there. laughs> yeah, it was delicious. Uh, Dudes Brews asks, "Is the Truman is it the Truman's eighteen ninety style that the export is based on?" Uh, is it a Truman's? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, if you don't know, we can find out and put it in the comments. After I don't. We'll. I, I'll get the inf the info on that. Um, it's funny. I'm confusing these in my mind because I used to work for another brewery that made a. Uh, a start that was based on an old courage recipe. So I'm going to say I'll, I'll pass on that for the moment. Um, yeah. That is, that's a thing with a lot of the kernel beers though, right? They're like based on historic beers. For sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, not the hot forward beers, but yeah, 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 the, yeah. Old, the old school beers, we all, we always look back and it's, um, yeah. I got a lot of books by Ron Pattinson. What can I say? <laughs> I shout you do, shout yeah. out Ron Pattinson. If you're, if you're, He's Stand not watching. So, <laughs> uh, he, he does watch us. He stuff. does watch us. Uh, he yeah. might watch this one. So he, he might be out there. Uh, also, people, I can't find the comment right now because I'm hovering over. We met before Ron uh, at Partizan back in the day. Anyway, uh, we, we drank some beers. Anyway. <laughs> what did you drink? Is that uh, is it yeah, historic? Uh, we, we did the um, uh, 4X, if you remember. Oh, uh, yeah, my yeah, old, yeah, like, yeah, um, yeah. Oh, my man, God. Yeah. Pink oh, label. Yeah. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the <laughs> uh, does Colonel have any plans to utilize modern CO2 capture tech? No. I guess <laughs> given that you don't force carb, there's not a huge amount of point. There, there, there isn't. But yes, I, I mean, of course, we try in as best we can to be as uh, eco-friendly in the brewery as we as I've we seen can so many solar um, panels as I've walked around these deep underground... Uh... <laughs> Railway arches. There, there are more and more. I, so the, the next step for us, I think, will probably to be able to get a silo for our grain and stuff like yeah. that. Um, and so we would just like kind of see two on that front. It is something that is very at the forefront in the brewery in terms of like how actually we got a little award from our um, uh, waste company for, um, you know, how much we recycle. So um, we do our absolute best. Um it is a small facility, and there's there's a lot that goes with that, um, and also there's a lot of constraints with the, as you guys know, and we've seen now the constraints with the the environment. Um, so yeah, we, we push for that every time we can, and um, we try to be as close to carbon neutral as we can, if that could ever be a thing. So yeah, I mean, it, it's I think one of the big challenges that craft beer has ahead of itself, in particular the fact that craft brewers don't actually control a lot of the large carbon footprint, which is actually in the production of well, hops in particular with the irrigation, not necessarily yeah. carbon footprint, but in terms of water usage. And, right before it even gets to Yeah, that. yeah. It's, um, you know, it's something a lot of the bigger brewers are uh, working on and we can all hate big brewers for all the bad stuff they do, but a lot of them are involved in the research for making. Yeah. Well, I think um, that, that means like from their perspective, that's like the bottom line, isn't it? Mm. Like how can we make this more efficient? more cost effective which yeah. is yeah, exactly but oftentimes uh, that if, means it, if it also helps the environment then yeah. great but yeah. Yeah. yeah no you're right you're absolutely right um, but that's you know that's sort of like i'm not comparing 
macro beer to NASA. But, but you know, but go NASA ahead. developed like, <laughs> like <laughs> good finish. That's a Velcro, microwave yeah. ovens, all like all this like future crazy technology that brought us like slap bang into the next century. It's all sort of like because we wanted to, uh, you know, go into the stars. And, 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 and if you want to learn more about that exact topic. My upcoming book, The Meaning of Beer, in June 2024, will cover all of such topics, like how beer invented the fridge. Beer created basically everything we know about microbiology and, indeed, how we cure diseases. Yeah. Um, and Guinness make really nice adverts. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm coming out with a book very slightly very earlier than you. Yeah. Covering May 2024. Similar how NASA is the same <laughs> as Anheuser-Busch. Uh, we've got a question for, as they put it, Mr. Bruiser Guy. Oh, yeah. That's what my friends call me. Mr. Yeah. Bruiser Guy. Uh, what he likes in beer. Mm. So what I guess what you like in what beer. What you like in beer. <laughs> what I like in like, beer. Can, can I throw him out in a slightly different way? Okay, you, you have just over 100 amazing breweries. Yeah. What are you looking out for in the breweries you work with? Yes. Okay. That's Because uh, that could mean a million different things. It, it possibly it could. Um, so... <laughs> We, when we started Bruiser, uh, the breweries that we approached initially were the ones that, that we like to drink, basically. Um, we, we saw the gap in the market we saw was that in other subscription services, you weren't necessarily getting the breweries that we would go to the bottle shop and pick out um, or go to the tap rooms of um, or try at beer festivals. So we asked ourselves why, and then we, we dug into it and we, we kind of went down the route of, well, let's get all of those breweries into one subscription if we, if we can um the colonel being one of the breweries that's been with us from the very start um and i think what we try to show in bruiser is that diversity of uk craft and you know you guys have a very unique proposition i think to to people who drink your beer as does every other brewery out there at the moment um and we really wanted to capture that you know between people like holy goat who do incredible sour beers and, yeah. and Shout out holy goat in that niche amazing uh, in Dundee, and then you've got the likes of the, the big juicy uh, pails and IPAs, Verdant Tracks, Clive Waters that have become such a hit. Yeah. Um, you know, Wilderness in Wales uh, and Wild Horse up in, in Cardano. We, we wanted that geographical and that, that sort of style spread, I guess, and, and trying to give people the ability to explore the scene for what it is, basically, which is an incredible diversity in beer. Um, and that's, that's what I'm going to love. My journey started as in a pub with with bitter and it was a shepherd Dean pub and you know we uh I, I the first beers i had were vicious finger and and spitfire and you know that that kind of started my journey but then i like to think that it's developed a lot into exploring the the diversity of the uk craft beer scene which is what we've tried to build in in bruiser so yeah there awesome. you go uh, and you can join bruiser with the code cbc8 to get eight pounds off your foot. Oh, what's Brad doing? That's, what are you? Just, oh, oh. Subscribe. Subliminal messaging. <laughs> subscribe. <laughs> subscribe. This is a nineties music video. Uh, we've got we've got another super chat. Very nineties. Uh, this is this is definitely one for you, Chris. What water chemistry is best for dark beers? Is it London tap water? Well, London tap water is uh, is traditionally great for that because. Uh, and, and as a person who homebrewed in London uh, before, um, I can suggest that, yeah, it absolutely is good. I, you know, hard water is good. Like a lot of like kind of uh, uh, chlorides is uh, kind of very good for dark beer. You don't really need to, um, if you're using dark malts, they produce a lot of acidity naturally um, in the beer. So you really don't need to worry too much about um, getting your pH into the right place for the mash, mash because you'll probably find that it, it will get there naturally. Um, uh, so yeah, I think you're looking at, um, traditionally like places like, um, you know, kind of, uh, Scotland and, uh, the kind of, uh, London brewing scene were the places that produced those kind of like classic dark beers because the water was just good. And just remember that people were not treating the water back in those days, you know? So the beer styles that emerged out of these places, it's no coincidence that, you know, London became famous for, for Porter um, and, you know, you were getting those kind of like Scotch ales up in like kind of Edinburgh and Glasgow and uh, that, you know, even in Dublin that they were producing like kind of those like Porter style that ended up becoming like kind of dry, like a Irish dry style um, so, and a Czech Pilsner and stuff. So the, 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 and, you know, Burton Ale, all that kind of stuff is like, we know that the water chemistry was traditionally 
what kind of spurred people on to make the beers that kind of suited the best. Um, so yeah, I've, I've, hard and water is better for that. I would suggest um, if you're home brewing. Um, Great. Sorry. You said um, as if you, you had like another thing to add. Yeah, but I, then... I was thinking of something, but uh, it's probably gone. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, so we've got, we, we've got one final question. I've seen two people ask it and I haven't managed to find either of them while Chris was just chatting. Uh, but the, the last question I want to take from everybody is um, what beers from other breweries are you really enjoying right now uh, that, that would deserve a shout out? I love uh, when I go to the shop and buy beers, um, it, it's a weird thing when you work in the beer industry and these guys will know the same. It's like when you, you know, you have access to drinking a lot of beers, like kind of all the time, um, you can fall into your same old patterns. And I think I am, um, I do my best at being quite good to go out and have a beer sometimes because really because I want to go and drink a beer that someone else has made, or I want to drink something that I think that tastes very good. Um, something that I'm interested in. Um, I really love the uh, mixed firm offerings from uh, Burning Sky um, uh, almost all the time. But, you know, if I see, I also love Burning Sky beer on cask. I have to say Plateau, uh, incredible Aurora, incredible beers on cask when you can see them. Um, not so much in London um, that I've come across these days, but I'm not in central London that much. Um, uh I have to say, I love to drink Fuller's beer on cask because it's exceptionally consistent. Um, and I've got a few pubs local to me, and those things are really great to go and drink. Shout um, them out in Lee. Which which pubs? Lee or Lord, Lord Northbrook? Amazing place to go and drink beer. Uh, the Partridge in Bromley, amazing place to go and drink. And like a, a a flagship Fuller's pub in a beautiful old bank. You just have to go into that place, and it blows. Is you that away. the one opposite the cinema? Uh, no, that's the Star oh. Garden, which is an independent pub, but yeah. just but it's just down from there. Right, it's just down from there. But pint of ESD in there, amazing. Um, and I, I I like to go um, places that I like to go and drink uh, kind of independent beer. I love to go and drink beer at Hopburns Black. It's a great place. A couple of us from here from work will go like to pack them occasionally and drink some beer there. And you know, that's where I like to go and sample beers from the rest of the UK that I'm not necessarily getting on draft all the time. Sometimes I'll have and can and some of the very progressive modern forward thinking beer that's, you know, coming out there, particularly the like kind of new England styles and the like kind of bigger beers, um, which I really enjoy in, in that kind of context. And I think for me, that's the kind of context for them. I don't, they don't feel like sessionable beers to me, but I love to go and sit and have like two or three beers after work. That's Get so your different tech to out make. and uh, have yeah. a sip. Well, I mean, it's great, but yeah, exactly. It's great. For for two hours after work, that's a lovely thing to do. And because it's so divorced from what I do and different. Um, and also just go go somewhere, go and find somewhere that does really good German or Czech lager and just drink that by the pint because that stuff is bloody great. I think we can all agree on that. Amen. Amen. Um, well, we've run out of time for tonight. Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. Thank you so much, uh, Lewis, for joining us and Chris for um, keeping our shit together. It's been, lots of people have been saying in the comments, it's been a really educational uh, live show for them, which is not always the case. Uh, this is not surprisingly. I think we've kept it together like really well this yeah. evening. It was the pizza. It must have been the pizza and the desperate <laughs> dash around the brewery going, we can do a brewery tour five minutes before this starts. Um, but it's been absolutely joy to see all these comments rolling in. K Colonel are, you know, for, for, for me, one of the most important breweries, not just in the UK, in the world, and, and that have continued to be incredibly important by, like you've said, you know, that, that mix, you know, bottle conditioning, big mosaic IPAs, producing historic recipes, getting into lagers and using new world hops. You know, there's nobody who does Colonel quite like Colonel. Table beer. Come on, let's and give it a little bit. Yeah. 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 We didn't even, didn't even touch table, 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 beer. table beer, which is just an absolute like It used to be the lifesaver of every, whenever you were going for a drink and you wanted like a roadie from a corner shop and you'd go in and inexplicably, table beer would always be there. And you know, it's also every uh, Colonel member of staff's like kind of go-to beer when you're on a beer festival. It's like you've been there, you're on the second day, you're midway through. Where's the table it's beer? It's like, I just got to, well, I'm yeah. stuck here. I'm, I'm out, all I'm doing is drinking beer and serving beer. I gotta have the table beer. <laughs> it's the one. It's, so that's it's why it's one. on draft. It's if you're ever one. wondering, yeah. uh, somebody did ask if uh, you'll see us at London Craft Beer Festival. 
Uh, I'm hosting tastings all weekend. Brad will be there for at least one session. I'm going to be there all the time because it's 10 years with the Craft Beer Channel. Join our Woo! Patreon. Join our Patreon. Sign up to our Sub newsletter. Like and subscribe to our like YouTube channel. Like and subscribe. Channel. Come to our beer We will be there from the Colonel also. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah, that's where I was supposed to go with that, but I got derailed. Uh, do you think Rooza? Well, and Rooza will be there. Rooza yeah. is going to be hot. Going to yeah. wear short shorts, Johnny. You can wear the shortest shorts. And those, those oh, sandals that you wore in our documentary, the yeah. Yeah. Well, match up hot pants. I'll, I'll see if we hot can do pants, it. yeah. I'll have to trim my toenails. Oh, 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 yeah. <laughs> Gel yeah. sandals and hot pants. <laughs> I can't. Yeah, baby. I can't end a live stream on this. <laughs> <laughs> Bloody hell. Uh, right. It's uh, wholesome, Johnny. It's a, what, a, what a gathering of minds. your sandals. Beautiful. That's about as wholesome <laughs> as it gets. There we go. We can end on a pun. Um, bless you for joining in. Uh, please do join our Patreon, like and subscribe. Um, and, of course, buy Colonel Beer. Join Bruiser with his code CBC8 and support small ethical businesses. Uh, double IPA? Let's, um, let's I'm going to drink some more damson, mate.